CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. Uh, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on April the 1st. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. It was not an April Fool's prank that we had some technical problems uh, this evening getting the meeting going with our Zoom connection. So I'll explain what's going on for people who are in, in uh, observing on Zoom. Our ACMI lets, has told us that the broadcast is functioning as normal. The um, individual select board members and key staff are logged on with our computers um, over Zoom when we're logging on. So we can hear people from Zoom in the room and, um, and I just realized that was All right, hold on. To, Hold on a second, oh, Sean. Sean. So, Sean, I'm having to mute myself, and I'm um, just now getting feedback when I unmute my uh, my laptop. So, this is a problem. Says I'm in. Testing one, two, three. Yeah, that's a problem. All right, maybe he'll come up. Sean, if you can hear me, uh, give, give us advice over the speaker or uh, come on up. Testing again. Okay, Sean. So whenever, whenever I um, unmute myself in Zoom, it's is it this room? Is this machine here? essentially have a Zoom meeting where we're all sitting here. These folks go up to this laptop. Everything else is just working through the computers. Yeah, so yeah, actually that's just kept off or muted. Uh, yes. Unless people on Zoom are talking, maybe have one dedicated computer. Uh, but then, like, you shut that off. Can't we all then now just turn our volumes up a little bit so we can hear on our... Yeah, I think we could, it's worth testing. We'll see. We, we could get audio feedback problems with, you know, with individual as speakers. As long as only you want to crank the volume on just one central laptop. I think you know, but speaker. feedback yeah. is from a microphone, right? Not well, feedback speakers. is from, from individual laptop mics picking up the sound from, from another person's computer. Yeah, the Zoom, typically Zoom doesn't send out audio for your, when you are the speaker. Mm -hmm. And so typically that computer is the host. All these microphones act as the microphone for that computer. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's one thing I didn't consider how I was picking up this backup plan. <clears throat> my, and my, making matters worse, my Zoom connection just went down. <laughs> so it, it goes, it flakes on and off anyway normally. It's just, and it's just a function of this laptop, I think. So I'm not currently on Zoom. <laughs> of course. It usually reconnects, but. Yeah, Are you on the Wi Fi? Okay. Yeah, until someone on Zoom is speaking. I'll, I'll keep thinking of ultimate solutions, but... Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, this is Chair Eric Helmuth, and um, 
if somebody in Zoom can raise their hand, we're having some, obviously having some major technical problems with our Zoom connection tonight. If someone in Zoom can raise their hand if you can hear me. Looks like we have everybody raising their hand. Okay, good, time. thank you very much. Um, now let's um, promote somebody just as a test, uh, maybe Representative Garmley. Okay. Um, actually, you know what, I'm just gonna allow him to talk, so, because uh, I think I'm a co-host. Um, Representative Garbley, can you hear me? Here he comes. Here he comes. Hey, Representative Garbley, uh, can you help, can us, help us, out here? us out here? And let me know if you can hear me and you can try talking. I can hear you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Okay, now I'm going to turn on my speakers. I'll try again, Sean. I can hear you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, now. So we have some... I think we need to pick a laptop to have one laptop to have the sound. So, yeah, we're going to get the thing. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn my speaker all the way down. All right, I'm off. I can hear you. All right, thank you. Sounds like there's some sort of feedback. No, and I think the, the the feedback was because my I had my mic on and it was picking you up a little bit. So even from that distance, it's it's feeding back. They're very sensitive. How about, How about now? now? Can you still, can you hear, still us? hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Can you guys can you guys hear that yeah. loud enough? Yeah. Ask him if you could hear me. Sean, are, Sean, you, are you able, able to, to hear the chairman? The chairman? Um, a Anytime. little bit. It's a little faint. And I can hear you perfect, Ashley. Okay. Are you muted? So we have to unmute every time you want to talk. All right. So I'm just, I'm testing now. This is the problem. Could I just sit here? What about that one? What about if I made that one the one that talks and speaks, and that way I can toggle you guys? No. Oh, you probably can't hear You me. just un unmute and you can talk. Right. Test. 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 We're good. Let's, let's do the best we can. Yeah. <laughs> You've been here all night. <laughs> let's go. All right. We're all just right, going to try to roll with this and this see what happens. See what happens. Um, so this is Chair Eric Helmuth. We're obviously having some technical difficulties with the Zoom. We're going to try this and see how it goes. What we've had to do this evening is the room Zoom connections off. So a bunch of us are on. Unmute that while you're talking. Yeah, no, I just, but I just got muted. But you. Yeah. yeah we just need to m mute the machine, not the. Picture. You're muted, Mr. Chairman. You're unmuted. Okay, okay I'm, back. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Um, um, so, each, so each individual we, members and staff are on Zoom, and we're trying to figure out how to do this with uh, without audio feedback. Please stand by. There's no, I don't think there's any way around that. I don't think there is. I don't think we want this for the speaker down. Speaker on right now. Yeah, right. right. We well, only I want think this speaker on. <clears throat> right. Right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. if you turn that speaker down, just, you know, just the computer, not the. Yeah. 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 Did you turn the speaker off yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I used the wrong word. It shouldn't have been. Try to get the speakers off. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, uh, okay. So okay. that. So we have. So when I go back off on mic. So Sean's in the in the meeting now, so we won't hear him unless those that speaker's turned back up, or I suppose mine is. Yeah, that's the only way we're going to get a Zoom yeah. participants audio into this room. Okay. All right. All I right. think I we have a plan. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and that and that's fine as long as the public can hear what's going on in this room. Yeah. So maybe if, as you begin your introductory remarks, Mr. Chair, if you could just confirm 
um, if members of the public could just raise their hand to confirm that they can hear you and hear us, that would constitute adequate alternative means for the public in terms of accessibility of this meeting. Okay. okay. We should test it every time. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll do a, we'll good, do test. a good test. All right, I think All right, we, I think have, we a have a plan. Um, and uh, we'll go forward the best we can. Tonight's meeting is, uh, I guess uh, first I'll just double check to make sure that the people on Zoom can hear me. So if, uh, if uh, John, uh, Lessie, you're on Zoom right now. If you're able to hear me, would you raise your hand? Great, thank you, sir. Okay, so um, this meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and uh, at least to some extent over Zoom <laughs> as best we can. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Um, you can find, if you're on Zoom or on ACMI, you can find the posted agenda items on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and meeting and minutes page. And uh, we have a makeshift Zoom, Zoom solution right now. If at any point that fails, uh, we'll make a decision here in the room. We do have a quorum of select board members. We can continue the meeting, but I think we will be sensitive to the fact that we've advertised a public hearing and we wanna make sure we will prioritize, uh, including having to reconvene if needed, um, to make sure that the public does have a chance to participate. And I guess I'll say this, that because these are public hearings on warrant articles and it's very important, um, we'll give this the best go that we have. Um, and you know, as long as I am confident, Attorney Cunningham is confident that members of the public can fully participate over Zoom, we'll proceed. If at any point it becomes clear that we can't, I think I will suggest that we adjourn and we'll reconvene at another time. Does that sound good to you, sir? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. It, just pursuant to the open meeting law, the public has to have the opportunity to participate um, both here and speak if, if allowed by the chair on, on these matters before the board tonight. And as long as they're able to do that, that constitutes adequate alternative means and that would satisfy the open meeting requirement and the meeting can proceed. And, and was you, uh, were you unmuted on Zoom at the time when you were just speaking? <laughs> as we all get used to this. That would be a negative. <laughs> you might want to have a, try that again. Just so we can get that ready to Zoom. So for, for uh, select board members and staff, when, when you want to talk, we'll just unmute ourselves at our laptops. I think I'm unmuted now, Mr. Chair. Yes, you are. Um, as I mentioned, under the open meeting law, uh, it's required that the public have adequate alternative means to participate in tonight's meeting because this was advertised as a hybrid meeting by the select board. So as long as the public can hear uh, what's going on when all speakers can be heard clearly by either Zoom or phone or any other alternative means and they can participate uh, if called upon by the chair, then the requirements of the open meeting law have been satisfied and this meeting can proceed. Thank you very much. Are we allowed, Attorney Cunningham, are we allowed to unmute? Unmute yourself. <laughs> Attorney Cunningham, are we allowed to monitor the chat function in Zoom? As long as we're not participating, I guess. I have chat. Well, I'm just, I have it open here, and if someone can't, if I'm speaking and someone can't hear me, they can just say, can't hear you. It's disabled. I wonder yeah. if I can it, um, the okay. Q and the Mr. Q and Chair, if I may. Yes, sir. I would, it'd be preferable if the chat preference, uh, chat option were disabled, and if the individuals in the listening public wanted to speak, perhaps raise their hand, right. and then at an appropriate time could be recognized by uh, the administrator and, and then considered for comment by the board. And I, I will note that we do, um, we do have the Q&A enabled as well, so we can monitor that, which is a one-way communication. All right. And I was able to, I just kept my microphone on the whole time. I don't know that that created problems, so we might be all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think it's enough preamble. Uh, let's move ahead with our agenda and uh, we'll start with the uh, proclamations. We have a proclamation that is in the select board agendas and minutes. Uh, the text of there is there and uh, it's for the community development week, April one through five. Now entertain a motion from the board. Move approval. Uh, Mrs. Mahan moves approval. Second. And second from Mr. DeCourcy. Any further discussion? Okay, and a motion from Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Um, all in favor say nope. We're, we're gonna do a roll call, aren't we? No. <laughs> no, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> Mr. Cunningham. 
Who is muted? Okay, sorry. Yes. No, he's not. Sorry, Mr. Chair. You don't, you don't have to do a roll call because all members are, are present. Physically present. All right. All, right. So, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is a 5 nothing vote. All right. Now we go on to the consent agenda. Uh, this is items 3 through 6. We have the acceptance of funds from various entities from Colleen Legere, the Director of Health and Human Services, the Rotary Club of Arlington 100th Anniversary Banner Approval from Bill Hainer for the Rotary Club, request for a special one-day beer and wine license on April 13th at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for the Mononymy Beer Hall from Sarah Lundberg, Director of the Arlington Historical Society. We have another request for a special one-day beer and wine license on April 27th at the Arlington Community Center for an ACA, Arlington Center for the Arts Spotlight Fundraiser from the Executive Director, Tom Formacola of the ACA. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve this consent agenda by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. Any discussion? By hair. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. That takes us to item seven, appointments. The Council on Aging, we, aging, we have uh, Melissa McInerney and um, Dr. McInerney, are you in the room or on Zoom? If you are on Zoom, please raise your hand in Zoom. She's there. She's there. They're coming in. Where is she exactly? I saw her. Oh, there we go. Good evening, Dr. McInerney. Hi. Hi. Um, so we're doing the best we can with our, with our Zoom, um, but if you would just uh, introduce yourself and say a little bit about your interest in serving. Great, my name is Melissa McInerney. I really welcome the opportunity to be considered to serve on the board for the Council on Aging. I'm an economist at Tufts. And in my research, I study what can help more older adults participate in the safety net programs they're eligible for and what the benefits of those safety net programs are. And so I really welcome the chance to help adults in Arlington receive the benefits they're eligible for. And I'm especially excited about this year's, I guess, launch of the new, is it the property tax circuit breaker? Um, so I, I'd love to find a way to move my research into practice in Arlington. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much. And I'll, I'll turn to the board. Mr. Hurd. I'd like to move approval. And uh, it's a little crazy in this room to listen to our, the feedback from our own voice. But it is funny that there's a number of volunteers on the town board. So economics are. professors at Tufts University. And I was an economics major at Tufts <laughs> University. So it feels a little nostalgic. But certainly, um, you have an amazing resume and, and we're really happy that you stepped up and we're willing to serve. This is a very important bo board that we rely on um, and you know, it helps seniors across the town. So thank you for your willingness to serve. Well done, Mr. Hart. Did he most, he well, most, I'll second. So second. All right, any further, any, any further discussion? Mrs. Mahan, yeah. and unmute yourself, please. I, I think I have. Um, I just want, I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. McInerney. Really appreciate uh, you taking on this position as well as um, your resume curriculum vitae that you provided us. And um, one of the things that's really important, similar to what, what you brought up about tonight, a Warren article that we're having to give seniors some relief, but is the outreach and being able to communicate um, with our seniors who um, sometimes age is not the only um, communication uh, path. Uh, as we get older, I, can, I won't go into my bursitis or anything like that. But I, I do appreciate that, that you definitely have a lot of experience with that, putting aside grants and grant writing and all that. Um, and uh, I, I know you'll be a good advocate for that. I was just wondering if you had like three or four sentences in terms of talking to the, the senior population perhaps um, what your style is or things that you know have worked or anything that you'd like to bring to the council? Sure, so I look forward to learning more, um, but what I would love to bring to the council is um, a willingness to listen and to see how I can help. The particular angle I bring is an interest in 
the social safety net, but I know the Council on Aging serves many, many functions. So I'm, I'm very open to learning how I can be most helpful. Thank did that you. answer Thank your you. question? You know, you, you definitely, know, you did. definitely and I, I mostly ask for people who are watching, they got a couple, got a couple more, you know, a little bit more sense from you and I look forward to your service on the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Mr. Dickens, and unmute yourself, please. The only reason I'm not going on and on about how impressed I am is because of the audio issues and because we're getting a late start and I have some interesting questions, but I can get in touch with you later on, but truly impressive and thank you for, for, um, for joining and, um, us with the Council on Aging. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. Any further discussion? Okay, we have an enthusiastic uh, motion for uh, approval by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? is unanimous. Thank you for your patience this evening. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. We are thrilled to have you on board. Okay, okay. that takes that us takes to, to uh, traffic rules and orders, uh, other business, future select board meetings. So um, we are now, the only, we are just scheduled through next week, April the 8th. Um, I believe that's right, Ms. Murr. That's correct. So, April 15th is a holiday, and, um, but how about the 22nd, because we're telling, well, that's a holiday as well, right? That's why we're not starting town meeting. So, right, any thoughts yeah. from the board? Anybody who might be chair in the near future? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, yeah, Mr. So Mr. it Chairman? starts the 24th, yeah. right? Yeah, town meeting, town meeting begins the 24th. Yeah, I, I don't, I know that the 15th is the, um, the holiday week. I don't know if it makes sense to have the, something on the 17th. I don't know if there's anything further that we're going to need to, to do. We, but maybe there should be one meeting before town meeting. Yeah, I like the 17th. Um, but unless, uh, would you prefer the 16th, Mr. Hurd? That's a holiday. Well, the 16th is? So, the 15th is. I thought the 15th. I mean, but the 15th the, is Patriots Day, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely not the, the 16th. Not the 16th. Um, so 17 looks good. 17. Call it myself. What's up? Schedule for the 17th and right, we're away, we're away. Yeah. yeah. It gives me, I, I guess we, we're going to open up a, a warrant for a special town meeting, right? So I imagine we'll have to do hearings for that too. No? Uh, and you're, you're currently muted, Mr. Dickens. Oh, sorry. I just happened to notice. So well, while I was talking, I saw Mr. Hurt waving his hand. So did you want to say something, Mr. Hurt? No, I uh, so, so, so then we, we, how are we going to have the special town meeting? Because we're going to open a warrant for that. And well, I think we haven't gotten to that agenda item yet, which is next. But um, maybe, maybe we can take that up when we get to that, you know, just continue the discussion there. But that would influence when we would want to have our next meeting, no? No? Well, the special town meeting will be, I mean, if we, if we do that tonight, as anticipated on the next agenda item, then, then uh, we'd still want to meet on the 17th, right? Yeah, okay. Right, right, right. So I was saying, saying that would influence when we want to have me, uh, another meeting. So definitely want to have one before town meeting because we're going to have to dis discuss some items. Oh, and put something on the warrant. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we still have the 8th, correct? We have to meet on the 8th. We have to meet so on the 8th, yeah, yeah. So we could do that. So we could do it then, right? Yeah. Mr. Freeney? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> with respect to the meeting on the 8th, what we were intending to propose on item 9 for uh, not only a date for the special town meeting, but then in item 10 for the opening of and closing of the warrant was intended to be on April 9th, so that mm. would actually fall after the 8th. So I would recommend a meeting on yeah. the 17th yeah. if possible. Yeah, so we definitely want one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So can, do we at least have three people who can meet on the 17th? I know myself and Ms. Mahan, yeah. Mr. DeCourcy. So we from Quorum. Okay, so let's schedule the 17th and maybe talk about future meetings uh, when we get to the 8th when we're a little in better shape. And yeah, I think when we when, maybe next week we can we can look ahead to town meeting and uh, you know figure out which days we want to meet early to to get some business done. Okay, so item nine vote special town meeting uh, date to be determined. Um, Mr. Feeney, and unmute yourself, please. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So before the board this evening on uh, item number nine is a request to consider calling a special town meeting uh, this spring. This is necessary because the Attorney General's office has identified a procedural flaw that needs to be cured with respect to Article 12, the MBTA Community Zoning uh, Bylaw that was approved by special town meeting in October. So specifically, the vote language considered by town meeting in October did not explicitly reference a zoning map that contained the multifamily housing overlay districts. The vote language referenced all of the associated textual bylaw amendments, but it did not reference amending the zoning map with Arlington's proposed Section 3A districts. Of course, the zoning map and the detailed parcel listings were included in the ARB's report to town meeting. However, they just were not referenced in the actual vote language. So it seems the AGO is rightfully scrutinizing to the letter of the law with respect to the MBTA communities bylaw, given the rise of litigation elsewhere and just wanting to ensure that everything is valid. So we are being asked to address this technicality with more specifically crafted language to accurately capture the vote for the record. Uh, we do not have to mend or make any adjustments to our districts, which were already deemed compliant by the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. So in regards to timing, uh, a special town meeting can still happen within the annual town meeting, uh, though it would not be practical to do so earlier than May 8th, which is the fifth session of, uh, or the scheduled fifth session of town meeting. That was, of course, if the board agrees to proceed in order to correct this issue that was identified. So while we work through these additional steps, the town and the attorney general's office entered into an extension of the statutory 90-day review period for that particular warrant article, uh, which will now uh, expire on June 22nd. Uh, and I will note for the record that the fossil fuel-free demonstration pilot begins on May 21st in our DOER, Department of Energy Resources Acceptance Letter, acknowledged that the town may need to address uh, or would need to address any issues that arose with the passage of the bylaw. So we have notified DOER of this potential development and don't foresee uh, any issues with respect to our participation in the pilot, but we have uh, reached out to confirm that. So uh, I believe that would be it for Article 9 and then obviously Article 10, if the board does agree to move forward with uh, calling a special town meeting, we could discuss the potential opening and closing date for the warrant. Thank you very much. Um, it's very reassuring to know that um, it, it's looking like this will not disrupt the, the uh, fossil fuel pilot participation, which was why we queued this up for the timing in the first place. So if I understand correctly, you're suggesting uh, if the board would want to do this, that, that May 8th would be the first opportunity um, to, to actually vote to hold a special town meeting on that date. Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, to effectuate this change that has been requested by the Attorney General's Municipal Law Unit, uh, obviously this, this is a warrant article that would go before the ARB, and because of the timeline needed to advertise those hearings and to conduct those hearings, uh, it really wouldn't be possible to include the special town meeting prior to the 8th of May. Gotcha. Okay, so I will turn to the board for any discussion or motions. Mrs. Mahan, and unmute yourself, please. Um, would it be appropriate in my hearing tonight that we can make a motion to call for a special town meeting within the annual town meeting for May 8th, 2024, uh, commencing at 8 p.m.? Yes, Attorney Cunningham is nodding his head. That would be my motion. A second. Okay. Any discussion from the board? Mr. DeCourcy. I'll, I'll, oh, did you already second this? Yeah. I, I was going to second Mrs. Mahan's motion. But, but just maybe for the public's benefit, too, and Attorney Cunningham, if you can um, just confirm this. The reason on this why we want to have a special is that otherwise it, 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 we need the special town meeting to open and close in before June 22nd. And if, potential is a danger, although unlikely, that the regular town meeting could extend beyond that date. Jordan Cunningham. That's correct, Mr. DeCourcy, and thank you for making that clear for the public. And uh, this, this time, I will say that in conversations with the Attorney General's office, they 
as, as Town Manager Feeney indicated, they have found no fault with the district itself. It is, they have no, they've indicated no concerns regarding EOHLC's determination that the district is MBTA community's statute compliant. Um, they're not asking us to take up any matters related to a revision of the district. This would simply be a, a warrant article to accept, uh, to, to amend the zoning map of the town to include the district as was voted by town meeting at special town meeting last fall. So it's, it's, it should be a fairly procedural matter, it, but uh, the, I want to stress that the, the, the AG's office is not saying that our, our district itself is problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Further discussion? Okay, we have a motion uh, to call a special town meeting on May 8th at 8 p.m. by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. This takes us to item 10 for approval uh, connected to this, the opening of the special town meeting warrant. Uh, Mr. Feeney or Attorney Cunningham? Attorney Cunningham. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just remind the board as it knows that uh, for special town meetings, five days notice is required under pursuant to our bylaws and the town meeting, for special, the, the warrant for a t special town meeting uh, can be open and closed on the same day. Thank you, Attorney Cunningham. Um, so the implication of that would be, uh, I believe Mr. Freeney has suggested May 9th, or I'm sorry, April 9th is the day. Mm -hmm. Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, if the board is inclined, April 9th would work in terms of the timing required by the ARB to notice their hearings and conduct their hearings so that they could meet the May 8th uh, special time meeting date. Okay. And um, I'm just noting, uh, thank you to my vice chair, uh, that Tom is a participant in Zoom. Um, and this is not, this is not a, uh, an item, it's a public hearing, but I want to be sensitive to any technical problems they may be having. Um, so it looks like the hand is down, so I'll assume that we're all as well for now. And we, when we get to the public hearing, we will. Uh, it's in chat. That. He wrote his thing it's in chat. chat. He did write a question in the chat stating oh, that people speaking should, who are not speaking should mute. Following their comments, they're getting a lot of echo feedback. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Um, so any speakers in the room, um, if you're not speaking, just uh, mute yourself so you're finished. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, we, will mon we will monitor the Q&A if any people on Zoom want to contribute information like that. We very much appreciate it. And I have a display here. He's muted, so uh, I think we're good to go. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, I would entertain a motion uh, for opening the special town meeting warrant. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to open special town meeting warrant on April 9th, 2024 at 8 a.m. and close the warrant for the special town meeting on April 9th at 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Let's get you muted. All right. So we have a motion. Second. And a second by Mr. Hurd. Any discussion? So we have a motion to open the warrant for the special town meeting called for April the 8th on April the 9th at 8 a.m. and closing at 4 p.m. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Okay. This brings us to warrant article hearings. So I'm going to take uh, a block of articles out of order, and I'll explain uh, what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to take Article 14 a little bit later. That's the bylaw amendment focused residence picketing. Uh, we have a block of three warrant articles, Articles 20, 21, and 22. Those are home rule legislation articles. Uh, because of my employment by the state legislature, I need to recuse myself from those uh, articles so that for those next three, uh, I'll hand the meeting over to Vice Chair John Hurd. And uh, I would suggest to the incoming Vice Chair uh, <laughs> that he consider taking Article 222 up first. That's the home rule legislation for lowering the voting age. The proponent is a high school student, and this is literally a school night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Um, so uh, that will be up to the vice chair, but that would be my suggestion. I think the other two articles are likely to be pretty swift, uh, so we should get to Article 14 in pretty short order following that. Uh, good to go, Mr. Hurd? All right, uh, I'm gonna mute myself and leave the room. All right.
All right, following the chair's sage advice, we're going to take Article 22 out of order. So this is Article 22 is Homer legislation for lowering, lowering the voting age to 16 in local elections. And Ms. Maher, do we have oh, in person? Excellent. I'm going to go off, go muted in a second. If you could just introduce yourself and then you can get into your presentation, okay? High School. I'm here today to talk to you about Warrant Article Number 22. Um, next slide, please. There are numerous reasons why we should consider lowering the municipal voting age to 16. Doing so can improve civic education, uh, civic engagement, and empower young people. This is an abridged version of the slideshow, just so that all viewers on, uh, know that we do have a full version on the town website already if you would like to view the extended version. Uh, next slide, please. So the first topic we're going to discuss is improving civic engagement. Uh, next slide. Studies show that voting is a habit and that once someone votes in one election, they're more likely to vote in a subsequent election. And so lowering the voting age can serve as a catalyst for increased voter turnout. And voting a higher turnout is better for our democracy because we get to hear a larger number of voices. And so if we encourage voting earlier on, then we'll see a pattern of voting emerge uh, in Arlington voters. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, we're going to now discuss strengthening civics education. Uh, next slide. It is crucial to prioritize voter education in high school because after 18, students will go into higher education, enter the workforce with a full-time job, um, or whatever they choose to do beyond high school. And so reliable voter education becomes much more difficult. So Tufts University, uh, which Mr. Hurd has uh, graduated from, uh, have conducted several uh, studies on voter education and voter turnouts. Um, and we found that black and Latinx voters are least likely to be taught about registering to vote and encouraged to vote by high school teachers. And so particularly if we lower the voting age, not only will it improve education for all, but it will also help to promote diverse voices, um, which is really important when it comes to town measures. Uh, we want to encourage young people to get to the ballot box. Uh, next slide, please. And our last main reason is to empower young people who are ready to vote. Uh, next slide. Cold cognition is what makes up uh, measured, uh, measured decision making, I'm sorry. Um, and so the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is really what is responsible for what is called cold cognition. And so at 15 years old, it is basically formed and fully developed. And cold cognition capability does not improve in later years which is why 16 and 17 year olds tend to score about the same as older adults on political interest and understanding, um, thus meaning that on a biological uh, aspect, 16 year olds are ready. Uh, next slide, please. So on a similar vein, society acknowledges that 16 and 17 year olds are capable and responsible. We are given the responsibilities of safe driving, working jobs and paying taxes, and in some cases even being tried as adults for serious crimes. And so if we give teens these such responsibilities, then I believe that we should allow them to also vote for a school committee who represent them. Uh, next slide. So another common myth that I often hear is that um, young people are not interested in politics. Yet we see that some of the most popular extracurricular activities for high schoolers are Model Congress and Model UN, which are inherently political. Um, personally, I participate in Harvard Model Congress every year, um, and they told us that this year has been the largest on, on record of student participation. We also see, I guess in the real world, you could say, uh, with protests that youth are highly active. Uh, for example, 
in the Vietnam War, the movement for peace was largely youth-led, and in the modern day, we see that climate activism is largely uh, led by youth as well. Um, next slide, please. We also see that in Austria, whose voting age is already 16 years old, that when 16-year-olds are given the opportunity to vote, they take it. Uh, their, vote, their voter turnout is comparable to that of older adults. We see in this graph that the zero represents the average voter turnout. Um, and that we see that there's a decline after a few years because between the ages of 18 and 25 years old, for example, there are major life transitions, such as going off to higher education or getting a full-time job, that make it a lot more difficult for voters to make it to the ballot box, um, since voter registration is tied to an address. Um, and we see that in the United States, we do struggle with the same problems of young voters from 18 to 25 years old tending not to vote as often as their older counterparts. Um, so lowering the voting age, uh, hopefully we would see the same trends that we see in Austria where it would promote more voting um, and more civic engagement from young voters. Uh, next slide, please. And the last myth that I want to go over today is that this is just an extra vote for children's parents. Yet we see that in studies conducted in Scotland, whose voting age is also 16, that this is actually not the case. Um, teens are equally likely to vote the same as their parents as they are to vote differently. Um, next slide. So finally, if we were to make moves to lower the voting age, we would not be alone. Within the state, Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville have already submitted home rule petitions, and we see within the country and worldwide that there have been other efforts to lower the voting age. As mentioned earlier, Austria and Scotland are amongst some countries that have a voting age of 16 years old for their federal elections. Um, and uh, Representative Sean Garbley is actually here tonight on Zoom. He penned the uh, bill H686, uh, which would also do this on a state level. Um, I'm sure he would be happy to answer any questions if you had any. Um, next slide, please. And so thank you all for listening. Um, I will now take questions if you have any. We can also reference the larger slideshow, which does have more facts and figures if you feel so compelled. Thank you. Um, we'll first turn to the board to see if the board has any questions at this time for the proponent. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chen. Um, thank you, Ms. Chen, for all that hard work. Um, definitely appreciate it. I'm just wondering, um, not that I would expect it, this has happened already because you're just putting the proposal before us and then it has to go, if successful, to town meeting in the State House. But um, have you had any um, education or explanation um, amongst high school 16, 17 year olds, sort of an audience with them? Do you have any sense of, of if this is something that they're also kind of watching, and, and I say that in light of the fact that one of the things I and myself and my colleagues have been very encouraged by is especially the past few years, including this year, quite a few students from the high school and the middle school um, have participated in the Warren article hearing process um, with our fossil fuel Warren articles, with our ACE community electricity program, rate setting articles, not only have they been participated, I and my colleagues have been really impressed with a level of knowledge and understanding. They're not just coming in saying, I think this is a good idea, vote for it. They give us a little meat behind it, and they're obviously aware of what's going on. So I'm just wondering if, A, you have a sense right now, um, not that you can speak for an entire community population, or B, if, if you haven't really done that outreach yet, or what you anticipate in the future, if successful? Um, yes. So, oh, oh, oh no, you're fine. Yeah, she just has to. Okay, okay. sorry. Um, actually, the petition that I've um, collected signatures for largely was in part from teachers and also students who had recently turned 18. And so a lot of those students who uh, signed my petition said that they would definitely support this measure, and teachers who have observed students working in the school environment have observed 
the same thing, that like, students are eager, they're ready, they have learned a lot thus far in their education, and they have like, an eagerness and an understanding about politics that would be conducive to allowing them to vote at 16 years old. I also uh, mentioned this in one of my meetings at MSCAN, which is Massachusetts Schools Climate Action Network, um, and that has been a very popular idea amongst the participants of that meeting. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right. At this time, we'll start the public hearing portion. Um, and I believe we can promote Representative Garbley first. And then anyone else that would like to speak either in the room or in Zoom, if you can just raise your hand so we get a sense of who wants to, to speak on this in the public portion. Nobody in the room? Is, he, is Representative Garbley with us? Yes. I also see a hand raised from a phone in the center. Yep. So we'll go to Representative Garbley first. And Sean, can you hear us? I can. Thanks so much, Vice Chair uh, Hurd, for taking me out of turn. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for your inspiring uh, presentation on this important issue. I also want to thank the other members of the board, including uh, Member Diggins, who has worked closely uh, with the panel on this issue as well. I rise in strong support of the Warren article. Um, I try not to come to the board. I don't think I've come to the board in my 16 years of being your rep. Um, supporting a, a, a warrant article because I believe all of you are my colleagues. So um, I try not to go in front of you on specific issues, but I feel compelled uh, to speak because it really is about a piece of legislation that I have filed uh, for the past 10 years in the House of Representatives, which Sophie mentioned in her presentation, House 686, an act relative to age requirements and local elections, and I feel really uh, strongly about this bill to make it statewide. I think Sophie really, in her, uh, in her uh, arguments, she made a lot of important claims and, and uh, pointed to many studies on why lowering the voting age is so important for municipal elections. For me, this is about creating engaged lifelong voters and you starting at the municipal level for school committee and local office is a great way to create an engaged um, electorate young people going uh, as they get older and it's really really important as well as there's been at least 10 cities and towns that have filed similar home rule authorization to the state legislature like i said over the last 10 years from Cambridge to Boston to Lowell and out in, into the western part of the state. And in trying to get legislation passed statewide, it helps me as a member of the House to be able to point to cities or towns that have supported this effort. And it helps me to make the argument that this is something that the people of Massachusetts want and gives me a better chance and an opportunity to be able to get this piece of legislation uh, passed in the state house. So um, I strongly support this concept. I really appreciate the board taking me out of turn and I am grateful to Sophie for her outstanding work um, on this uh, bill and this issue. All right, thank, thank you, you, Representative Garbley. We actually did take you in turn. We didn't give you any special preference here, <laughs> but just so you know. All right, um, so we, now we have two more hands raised in Zoom. So we're gonna start with the hand that is a phone number. So once we promote you, please unmute yourself and just give us your name and address for the record so we know who we're speaking with. And you'll have three minutes to speak. Chris Loretti, can you hear me? I think it was you. I think it was me you may have been referring to. Um, um, 
So, so Chris, are you, Chris on are you on the Zoom in two places? Because I see your name, Chris. I am, I am well. um, because I'm not using Are, are you the, on the phone um, too? That's right, because I'm not using the audio on the computer. I don't have a, a microphone on it. Okay. Yep, Chris, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. And I'm frankly disappointed that your chairman recused himself because I really didn't think he needed to. But in any case, I think this article is a really bad idea. And I'd like to explain why. And I quote, the brain structure and function undergo considerable changes during adolescence. Adolescents are more vulnerable to irrational decision-making caused by impulsivity and reward or sensation-seeking behavior due to their psychosocial immaturity. Children's brains, children's brain regions connect to impulse control and emotional maturity are still developing, according to research. Now, what I'm quoting there is by someone from the a Youth Member for Coalition for Juvenile Justice. And what I would say to your board, Mr. Chairman, is if juveniles and 16-year-olds are not prepared to accept the laws of adults and be treated as adults in the legal system, then I don't see why they should be giving the right to vote in town. And, and I heard the uh, argument made that they pay taxes. Well, they may pay meals taxes if they go to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, but I don't think many 16-year-olds pay property taxes, and that's the principal tax in town. So I say no representation without taxation in Arlington. And I also take exception to the idea that this is not a political uh, aspect uh, or the political aspects of these types of votes and that they're not trying to support Democratic candidates. And I would ask your board and the proponents to cite the number of cities and towns throughout the United States that are, are in red states that have enacted versus uh, this type of legislation versus those in blue states. And I think you'll find overwhelmingly that this is this really is a political issue and a political ploy to elect more Democrats. So I hope you'll see through that attempt. And, and frankly, if students need better civics education to encourage them to vote, then that's a matter for the schools to address. I don't think it's something we should do by simply giving them the right to vote as, as minors. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. And I believe that is all the hands we have, Ms. Marr? That's correct. All right. And so we will turn back to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Attorney Cunningham? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I uh, just wanted to note that there is a draft motion in the material that's been provided to the select board and has been made available to the public. And I know it's in the title of the draft warrant article, but it's just stressed that this is for municipal elections only. This is not for state or federal elections for the public's clarification. And I also wanted to quick editorialize this. Um, commend Ms. Chen on her advocacy. She reached out to the legal department and was very, uh, very strong in her and, and provided materials that were very helpful in the legal department's analysis. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, Attorney Cunningham. And now I will turn to the board. Mrs. Mahan. Is that okay? All right, I just want to make sure. Um, and I, I want to thank you, thanks Mr. Chair, to thank uh, Town Council for pointing out that this is um, for home rule le legislation for 16 and 17 year olds for local elections only, um, which I think is the most appropriate um, for this type of uh, initiative. Um, moving forward, and as I st stated before, we've had over the past three to five years, especially the past two years, more and more increased, not just high school, um, which is 14 to 18, but also middle school students that have gotten involved, been civically engaged, um, and probably nine times out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, have spoken more eloquently than I have. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to move favorable action. Two, file home rule legislation to lower the voting age to 16 in Arlington in local elections. 
Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. You know, I'll second that. And, and um, I have um, a couple questions. You know, maybe just one. You know, and I'm not sure to whom I should address this. At this point, you know, I don't know if Rep. Garbley is still on. I need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, so I know that Rep. Garbley's legislation would make this automatic, being upon approval by the legislature. It doesn't have to come back to the municipalities, you know, for an election, you know. When we discussed this, we, you know, I think we could have gone one or two ways. We, you know, we either we, it's automatic if the legislature we, signs off on the legislation, or it could come back we, to the Arlington residents we, for a vote. You know, I guess I'll address this to Mr. Cunningham. Do you happen to know I mean, if all the other HRs by the other municipalities were automatic, or did any of them? So, Mr. Diggins. I think Attorney Munson is going to take any questions on the, this article. Okay, all right. You know, uh, so sorry about that. You know, uh, so uh, so uh, do you happen to know if the other uh, municipalities require that it be automatic or that it come back to um, any of them for a vote by their residents? So I can. It's me. So I can speak to um, the home rule petition that was filed in Boston, and the intention for that was for the legislature only to make clerical or very minor um, adjustments, I guess. And as far as I know, um, none of those, none of the home rule petitions that have been um, filed have actually been passed yet. I think they're still with the legislature. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, because the question is, do they require me? Uh, that oh. the residents me, or the voters vote me, to approve. Me. So the legislature would pass it, but then it would come back to the voters. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you want to mute? So. Yeah. yeah, so now I understand. So again, speaking only on behalf of what I know happened in Boston, um, there was not that requirement. So the intention then would be when the legislature passed it and the governor signed it, it would take effect upon passage. Yeah. So. This is a little bit strategic on, on my part, me, but also trying to get a sense of where the legislature's head is. Me. So my sense is that generally me, the legislature would prefer that the state be as uniform as possible. Me. That's my sense. Certainly Representative Garberly can tell me if that's incorrect. Me, uh, uh, me, and I guess somewhat unrelated me, uh, is if Representative Garberly uh, bill be, is such that it's automatic. Be, you know, I would be curious be, if we put one in that came back, required that it comes back to the voters, be, how the legislature be, would uh, respond to that. You know. So my suspicion is that be, this will have a hard time with the legislature because of my first statement, that is that they like everything to be uniform. Be, so, so either they will probably just be, pass a Representative Garbley's bill, you know, uh, or not pass anything, you know. But if there is any sense on their part that they don't want to be force any municipality to do something, me then they, if we had an hours, me that it could come back to the voters, me then then it might increase the chances that if Mr. Garbley's bill didn't make it, me ours would would stand a, a better chance. I am going to. Turn to Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And just to respond to Mr. Dickens' uh, question, just there would no, as currently constituted in the draft motion, there'd be no requirement that it come back to Arlington if it were passed by the state legislature. And although with, there's no way for us to know exactly what the state legislature is going to do, I think that I think that Representative Garbley probably had it correct that this, even if this home rule petition were unsuccessful uh, that Arlington files, it would be a demonstration to those in the state that. The, the more communities that are filing these homework petitions indicates a, a broader base of support and perhaps would uh, help Representative Garbley in his pursuit to pass statewide legislation. Understood, me, but having it be such that it would have to come back to Arlington residents, me, or voters, me, for approval wouldn't signal anything negative with respect to Representative Garbley's bill, right? You know, so, so it's really a matter of whether we want it to come back 
me to the Arlington residents you know, or voters. You know, and and I, mean, I can appreciate me wanting to just have it done, you know, but as I said, I, mean, uh, I think it gives the legislature an option, you know, that they might find, you know, more appealing, because, you know. so I just put that out there, I mean, it's something to consider, you know, so that's all, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Tocorsi. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and um, Ms. Jen, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I will be supporting Mrs. Mahan's motion, and, and I think um, I want to address a couple things. But first of all, I think your common myth number one about the 16 and 17 year olds, that to me is a strong argument for uh, asking for permission of the legislature, the town asking for permission for 16 and 17 year olds to vote. The fact that 16 and 17 year olds can drive. They can work jobs. Some choose to, and some don't. That's that's irrelevant. But you, you, you are working at 16. You're paying state and federal income taxes, and you're contributing to, I believe, Social Security at at that point as well. And and, and some of our aid comes from the state. So the fact that it's 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 whether it's property tax or or, or not is is it's, frankly for me irrelevant. It's 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 really the fact that that you're out there and you're following things. I think I think it's great at the local level. I look back. Um, when I was 16, it was 1980, it was a presidential election. I know there was a lot of people, a lot of students focusing on, on elections, and I think that's probably the case this year. We're in a presidential election year, and as Mrs. Mahan said, more of our high school students, middle school students are, are engaged in local affairs, and, and, and frankly, the, you know, above 18 and, and older, we haven't done such a great job getting out and voting either when you see 20, 25% turnout at local elections. So, um, I think for all those reasons, it, 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 it makes good sense at the local level. I think I'm comfortable with if town meeting goes along with this petitioning the legislature, not coming back um, and, and having a vote on it. But I think it's also significant for the legislature to see how many towns are going to do this, because unfortunately, this is probably going to take a while. And, but as we see more communities maybe attempt to do this, maybe there'll be more um, momentum at the state level would be great if it if it happens right away and and I appreciate you bringing this forward and, and all the work uh, that you did and all the materials that you provided that are available both to us and, and to the public through our agenda. Thank you, Mrs. Corsi. Um, Mr. Diggins, did you second the motion? I thought so, okay. yeah, but I certainly wanted to. So thank you. Yep. I just want to make sure. All right. Um, Thank you for the presentation. I, when I first saw this, I, I had some concerns, but I think your presentation for me, it was the myth number three that addressed my concerns. And so you, you were certainly well prepared for what the concerns of the board was gonna be. And you know, I just thought that you, you know, 16, 17 year olds, have, the parents have a fair amount of influence on what they do. And it could just be an extension of their vote, but I mean, you certainly came prepared with evidence to refute that that thought, and at the same time, it you know it will still be reflective of the general population, I guess. If and you would assume that most kids vote the way their parents raised them, but it's not always the case. So I, I'm happy to support this. Um, you know, I I think this will further the conversation. At the state house, the more towns that cities and towns have passed this, and you know, I, I anticipate it will still have an uphill battle given the current votes on the on the home rule legislations that's been sent to them thus far. But again, it keeps the conversation going, and the more people that say, "Hey, this looks like a pretty good idea," the more likely the legislature is to move and come around on it. So. Thank you for your work. Um, hopefully you don't have too much homework to go home to, um, but we are, th thanks for sticking in with us tonight through, usually our meetings are much more efficient than this. So you can come back to another meeting when, uh, when we're working a little smoother. So with that, I believe we're ready for a motion unless there's any final discussion. We have a motion to, for favorable action by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All that are opposed, 
That is a unanimous vote. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, Mr. Diggins. Okay. I just say a few words about about um, this article. Said, okay, one second. And the proponent, promote, primarily about the proponent. So this is we're taking up Article Twenty, Home Rule legislation relative to the town clerk. No, 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 no. So it's just a, a, a few words about the proponent. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that you know, uh, it, I, I was truly impressed me working with Miss Chen. You know, so see, she brought this article, you know, the idea up, you know, and and me initially me thinking about me the what we'd seen on some of the polls. You know, I I was hesitant. I mean, just personally, you know, I I would not have. Move something like this, me you know, on my own, me. But but I just wanted to be supportive, me you know, and and she, I thought, made a, a really good case, and and the caliber of work that she did was really um, very impressive, me you know. And so, me, if if there's just one person that deserves to vote, me at a younger age, me it would be Miss Chen. It'd be worth it just for that, me. But I've also worked with me a lot of other young, youth and young adults in town, and so um, she's not unique, you know, not only in Arlington, but also just you know, all over, you know, and so, so it's really good to see, you know, uh, youth and young adults, me you know, really trying to get more involved, and so I'm glad we, we did this, you know, and I didn't want to, like, try to push the agenda too hard or push the motion too hard earlier on, so I just want to save it for now. Thank you. All righty. Ditto. All right, now, now we're going to take up Article 20, Home Rule Legislation, relative to the town clerk. And Mr. Feeney, who, who's presenting on this? Attorney Monson? Oh, convenient. All right, okay. Attorney Monson. Attorney Monson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, so this is a Home Rule petition um, for to ask the town, for the select board to um, ask for authority from the town for you all to file a home rule petition to convert the elected town clerk position to an appointed position. Um, there are other municipalities that have done this before, um, not just for the town clerk position, but um, for um, the collector treasurer, for example, in Westwood, um, both Wenham and Rutland have had home rule legislation actually um, signed by the governor this year as special acts doing the same thing. And so there is some draft vote language and a draft home rule petition in the materials for you. It's kind of a compilation of some of the different um, acts that have been passed. Um, I will note that this question is going to be on the ballot. And so um, there will be a timing um, matter to make sure that the effective date that is in the home rule petition is going to obviously be aligned with any sort of um, elect uh, ballot action. Um, and I will also note too that the board should consider um, some bylaw amendments that also will need to happen to just make it consistent. And in terms of the particulars of the home rule petition, um, I think you know the home rule petitions are give broad authority to legislative bodies to be able to be flexible with the type of language you want to include. Um, it's sometimes better to include more particulars than not, such as, you know, who the appointing authority is going to be, whether it's a fixed term or serves at the pleasure of the appointing authority, um, any sort of duties you want to codify. And then in this particular matter, making sure that the current elected term of the town clerk is not cut short by the home rule legislation. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Attorney Munson. Any questions from the board? Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So those details that you mentioned, when will we work those out? I'm sorry. You yeah. muted, Mr. Diggins. I'm so bad at this. You know. So those details that you mentioned that you say it'd be better to have, or some cases people decide that they're better to have, when, when would we work those out? So. That's me. That's me. So I'll let Attorney Cunningham tell me if I'm wrong, but you know some of those discussions 
could happen, obviously, here in an open forum and a, to make sure that we're compliant with open meeting law. Um, there is draft language that um, you know I'm happy to walk through right now, certain provisions, and I can explain kind of where those came from in the meeting materials, if that's helpful. Uh, I would say not now, you know, uh, but I just want to have a sense of, of, of when and, and, and who. So, okay, great, thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I'm not asking for a big, long, protracted, because as you just stated, we, and Mr. Diggins, uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, but um, if this does go to town meeting, town meeting passes it, the voters pass it, the future amendments um, regarding classification, you know, position classification, compensation, um, how to consider the category independent, et cetera. Um, if the first two pieces of the process, town meeting and the voters at large here in the town of Arlington, when we do get to that part in the amendments that you cited, um, would that, I think I, I know the answer, but um, is that something this board individually can remedy or is that something this board individually can remedy with a warrant article to go to town meeting for a final vote? So if you could just speak, you know, on that. So if I understand, if I understand your question correctly, um, it's kind of the, the order of things in which they need to happen. So um, essentially what you would want to do is not want to make any sort of amendment on the bylaws, obviously, until you had the final language of the home rule petition. And I do believe that your um, instincts were right on that with respect to it being a warrant article. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any additional questions? Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I just have a question for the board. I mean, I, I understand why this is here, why we need to take action, but we've got the ballot question um, that uh, asking the voters to, 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 to vote this, this upcoming week whether um, we want to convert the town clerk position. It seems to me that um, we may want to wait for the results of that before we take action here. Just a, Question just for to, to, to allow the voters to um, do their their job and, 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 and come back to us on that. And I know we'll have time, but maybe a question for either you or Attorney Cunningham on that, on the, on the timing uh, of the actions. Attorney Cunningham. Well, first I want to thank uh, Deputy Town Council Munson for all of her work on this. Tremendous, great job as usual. Um, but uh, to answer Mr. DeCourcy's question, I would say that, I mean, it procedurally, the board could take the approach of a will report, as it has done already this one article season, if, if it was inclined to allow the voters to consider this matter first at the upcoming town election, and then at a later date before town meeting, at, before annual town meeting, uh, take some sort of vote regarding favorable action or some other action that the board wanted to take. It could do that uh, as a procedural path forward. Oh, it's a further question, if we waited until Monday, we still have time before we complete our report. Is that right? It, yeah, I, I just would like to hear from other members, but I mean, I, I wonder if we consider tabling this rather than doing a world report until Monday evening. Yeah. Mr. Diggins? Yeah. I was certainly fine with waiting in order to provide more detail. I mean, you know, so if we weren't so close I mean, to the election, you know, lots of early voting already, I, mean, I would be inclined you know, to flesh out as much detail as possible about this because I mean, that to me makes the decision um, easier. I mean, um, and certainly I mean, the devil slash genius I mean, are in the details I mean, when it comes to something like this. And, and, and so, but, but that's moot at this point, you know, and so, so I would say with respect to town meeting, I mean, my inclination would be to uh, provide as much detail as possible because I, mean, I enjoyed that, the process of thinking things through, I mean, but I could certainly hear the argument that that's still not enough time I mean, for us to think things through clearly, I mean, and, and, and I think that's 
the, the winning argument. I mean, it, it, and, and so whatever amount of time and whatever venue, I mean, uh, we need to, um, or whatever, in a, whatever manner we need in order to provide a really good you know, set of details is what we should do. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let me do this. Um, because we do have to have public comment yeah. before we make any motion. So let's go to public comment and then we'll have a discussion about you know, what we want to do as far as any motions. So at this time, we're going to open the public comment section of the hearing. If you are either in the room or on Zoom and you'd like to speak to this article, please raise your hand now. We know from the last one that is Mr. Loretti, and we will wait for Ms. Mrs. Marr to promote Mr. Loretti. Should be able to you want me to go ahead? Yep, yep. Ms. Loretti, you can start. Thank you. Um, I would just make uh, one request to the board on this and if you read the memo from town council that he sent on this article he seemed to be suggesting that you can completely ignore the vote of the voters this saturday on this question and even if they reject the uh, proposal to make the town clerk an appointed position you could go right ahead and submit this um, home rule legislation to town meeting give you permission and the state legislature could approve the conversion of that position to an appointed position. I'm asking your board to disavow that, that claim. Frankly, I'm not sure it's right. Um, town council sites, like towns like Wenham, that have done that without a vote, uh, like we're having on Saturday. But the town of Wenham has an open town meeting. So the very same people that vote in the town meeting are the, are the people who would vote in, on a ballot question. That's not the case in Arlington. Now, maybe you know why you were elected to your office, but I don't think I was elected to a town meet, as a town meeting member to disenfranchise the people in my precinct when it comes to voting for other positions in the town. So I'd like you to be very clear that you will not put this article forward unless the voters on Saturday approve the conversion of that position to a, an appointed office. Um, and I, I think that needs to be made very clear because I haven't heard any discussion or explicit discussion of that tonight, but that sure seems to me what town council was saying in his memo to you. Um, so I would leave it at that. I think this is a question that needs to be left to the voters. I certainly don't support it, but I will respect their decision, decision and I would ask you to do the same. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Loretti. Um, are there any other hands raised, Ms. Meyer? Seeing no other hands raised. And no other hands in the room. So we will close the public hearing portion and we'll go back to the board for any further motions or comments. I guess I'll do it. Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> um, uh, just a quick question through you, Mr. Chair, um, to town council or deputy town council. Am I correct that I have two options? I can move to will report or could I move to postpone to the April 8th meeting? I'm kind of leaning towards the latter, but what, what would you advise? Thank, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Attorney coming in. Um, yes, Mrs. Mahan, both of those are options. I think that the, we may run into timeline issues with the printing of the select board report. Obviously, there's a meeting for the select board on April 8th. Uh, whatever action is taken there, we'd have to do draft votes and comments. It could be difficult. I mean, the next meeting after that is the 17th, I believe, as voted tonight. Um, I'll talk to Ms. Ms. Marr, but I, I'm not sure that we'd be able to get that in the report to town meeting. But that. We could do it a different way, but that may present some issues on the printing. Okay, then I'll make a motion to will report. We have a motion to will report. Oh, no. okay. I'll second it. Uh, 
Seconded by Ms. Diggins. Any further discussion? All right, on a motion so, by... So I, I guess, so I just want to make sure, that, so will we be discussing this at all on the 8th? Okay, all right, all right, that's fine. Okay, so I'm fine, I'm even better with it now. All right, a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is a unanimous vote. And that takes us to Article 21, Home Rule Legislation to amend the Senior Citizen Property Tax Exemption. Mr. Town Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so this warrant article was originally submitted uh, on behalf of the Board of Assessors to sort of act as a placeholder while we contemplated the rollout and implementation of the uh, senior circuit tax breaker that was approved at the uh, the last time we were at the ballot uh, but I will note that as additional information emerged and as the Board of Assessors at their meeting on March 18th at which uh, Chairman Helmuth and member de Courcy myself and Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director uh, Alex McGee were in attendance we came uh, to the you know we sort of reached an agreement that it was best that uh, we take no action on this article, and the board uh, voted to recommend that the select board also uh, take no action on this article uh, until, you know, we, we may take it up in the future, but at this time there's just not enough information to consider what the implications uh, may be with respect to how this is going to roll out with the number of participants that may be eligible, uh, the amount of money that it may cost, and a number of things that would need to come into focus before uh, considering a measure like this further. Any questions for the town manager? With that, we will open the public portion of this hearing. If you have any comments to make on this article, please raise your hand in Zoom. Three, two, one. Seeing none, we will close the public comment portion of this hearing. Do we have any motions? Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'll move uh, no action. I want to thank Mr. Feeney for the summary of, of what took place at the Board of Assessors meeting. We have a motion by Mr. DeCorsi. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Diggins. Any further comments or discussions? On a motion by Mr. Corsi, seconded by Mr. D Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is a unanimous vote. And I'll bring back my esteemed colleague. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. I trust everything went well. Okay, so I believe that brings us to Article 14. This is the, uh, oh, thank you. I, I actually, I have Bylaw Amendment, focused residence picketing. I think we're gonna start with the town manager, followed by Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as the board is aware, there have been multiple targeted demonstrations outside of the governor's private residence uh, to date. Some of these have had significant impacts on the neighborhood as a whole, uh, especially those that have occurred late in the evening. Uh, you know, following at least one of those demonstrations, uh, Town Hall, we started to receive a number of neighborhood inquiries about why town officials were allowing this to occur, given that the affected residents live on a network of private ways. However, the town was not in a position to restrict in any way this activity due to the classifications of the roads, given that they are statutory private ways and in effect had to remain open to the public. So the town was only uh, in a position to enforce current bylaws that would ensure roads and sidewalks did not be, are not obstructed and that loudspeakers were not used after 9 p.m. Uh, didn't provide 
a large number of options for the town in response. So residents then question what else could be done to prevent this activity moving forward so they could enjoy peace and quiet in their neighborhood. So upon concluding research with town council regarding potential policy proposals, uh, the option before the board this evening uh, emerged after the board had convened, convened its meeting to discuss potential warrant articles. So in light of the closing warrant, I inserted this article to preserve the board's ability to consider a measure that may provide some relief to residents should the board see fit. So though this proposal certainly arises from experiences in a particular location, it certainly aims not to target any specific group, but it would instead apply to any groups targeting a specific residence, and that could be any residence in town. So one thing I will note uh, is that, you know, we did, as a courtesy, make the governor's team aware of this proposal, and I would note that it's expected the governor would support the measure if it did ultimately advance, if the board saw fit, and if town meetings saw fit. So uh, with that, you know, I want to thank uh, Chief Flaherty's in attendance this evening as an available for questions regarding any calls for service to date as a result of some of the demonstrations or the implications of this potential bylaw on the Arlington Police Department. And I thank the legal department for their research and due diligence in considering the different potential options that may benefit this neighborhood. Uh, and of course, if the chair would indulge, I would turn it over to town council to discuss further the language that was proposed. Thank you very much. One moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Feeney. Um, and now I will uh, ask Attorney Cunningham or town council to make additional comments. Uh, go ahead and unmute, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just to further the discussion, yeah, this was an important issue. Obviously, First Amendment concerns are something that are very seriously considered subject to a heightened level of security for, for important reasons that we want to protect the people's right to speak uh, and their First Amendment rights are not infringed upon. However, there are certain instances and it's outlined in the memorandum that's been provided to the board and is available to the public on the Select Board's website. The reasons why this particular proposed bylaw is legal, legally permissible and does not violate the constitutional rights of the First Amendment. Uh, specifically, as is cited in the memorandum, the Frisbee versus Schultz case which is a 1988 U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, took on this issue. There was a community in Wisconsin that had a similar issue where they had individuals targeting residences, uh, residents of a, in that case it was an abortion doctor, uh, groups of, of about 20 people. Uh, and they, the town enacted a, a, this type of targeted picketing residential ban. The Supreme Court considered it and determined it was not violative of the Constitution as long as it's narrowly tailored. And I, I would just highlight some of the language in the memorandum. Um, it is not facially invalid and, and is, is appropriate under the federal constitution if it's content neutral on its face, which this proposed bylaw is. It prohibits only focused picketing taking place solely in front of a particular residence. Number three, leaves open ample al alternate channels of communication for the dissemination of messages. Number four, prohibits the type of focused picketing which is fundamentally different from more generally directed means of communications that may not be completely banned in residential areas. And last, is narrowly tailored to serve the significant government interest of protection of residential privacy, especially where the picking is narrowly directed at the household, not the public, and where, even if some picketers have a broader communicative, communicative purpose, their activities nonetheless inherently and offensively intrudes upon residential privacy. So that was the significant governmental interest that the Supreme Court considered when it evaluated this particular ordinance from Wisconsin is that the individual in, in, in his, her, their home is unable to avoid this type of uh, communication and therefore it is not protected. I will note that the draft language that is before the board, if it is inclined to move this forward, um, is pretty much strictly taken from the Frisbee case and is the language that was approved by the Supreme Court. I think it was important to the extent that this board or town meeting is inclined to, to adopt this or move favorable action that we, that you know, we stick closely to that language because we know it's constitutionally valid. I think a deviation from that language runs the risk of running afoul of the First Amendment rights that are so, so well protected. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Attorney Cunningham. So um, we will all first, as our custom here, turn to the board for additional uh, comments and questions before we have public comment. 
Uh, and I think I'll start with Mr. DeCourcy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Feeney and Attorney Cunningham, and Attorney Munson, for the, the work done as, as, as well on the, on the research. And, and uh, for me, um, I am a neighbor of the governor, and, and I am aware of the protests that took place. I, I was there for, what, for one of them, and, and I certainly saw firsthand the, the invasion of, of privacy that takes place when you have targeted uh, picketing. I, I spoke to a number of, of neighbors um, who were concerned, just as Mr. Feeney said, there was concern about the roadways and, and, and received a number of inquiries about that and we got, got through that. But I, I look at this as something, um, and we may hear from Chief Flaherty later, that there are state laws on the books for unlawful dis assembly. There's nothing at the local level and this is something that we can do at the local level if, if, if we move favorable action. Um, to, to recognize that, that, that there is a significant government interest in protection of privacy in, in the residential home, and that's, that's, that's what this does. And as I looked into this and, and learned more from Attorney Cunningham's research and, and, and my own research is that this, the Supreme Court, as, as Attorney Cunningham said, in 1988, um, in its decision said that this is constitutional. In Massachusetts, Brookline has a focused residential picketing by law, the city of Boston has one. And, and just one comment in terms of um, one of the questions about when, whether this is narrowly tailored or not, is is there a possibility of putting time restrictions on this? And I, I, Brookline does not, Boston did. I will note that the two protests that made the news, one was at six o'clock, one was after nine o'clock, and they were equally uh, invasive and, and so, to me, um, in order to make this narrowly tailored, it would have to be an outright ban, having seen the different times, because the earlier protest, um, in my view, shouldn't receive any additional or, or be excluded um, uh, from this. Um, and, and I also just want to say, just as a matter of observing it, it, what makes this constitutional, again, is the invasion and, and there's this concept of the unwilling listener. When you go home, you should be free from intrusions. And there's also a captive audience doctrine that comes out of this same, same concern. And, and for one of those protests, um, I could have left my house, okay, and, and, and left across this, or nearby, they could not have readily left with the protest. And that's where the constitutional protections really um, should come in. And, 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 and I also will note that it, there, there is an impact on the neighborhood, people close by, um, and the constitutional analysis that Attorney Cunningham undertook were focused on, on the individual residents, but there is an impact on the neighborhood, and that was the reason why we got so many inquiries as well. It, it's it's um, um, it, you know, just very unsettling for, for others nearby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, any other members of the board, questions or comments for our team right now? Time. Uh, Mr. Dickens. Yeah, so. And uh, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. It, um, I'm going to say some things in hopes be that there will be responses in hearings. Um, and, well, as when we, when we hear from folks, you know, I understand the concern. I mean, I definitely understand the concern. You know, I'm going to give like a hypothetical scenario that may seem a little extreme. You know, uh, and and maybe I can get a response from from uh, the either my colleagues, Vean or or Mr. Cunningham, or Ms. Munson. I mean, but so let's say we, you know, we, the governor you know, and the neighborhood you know, uh, is extremely homophobic. You know, they see it, see you know, homosexuality is just morally repugnant, I mean, viscerally disgusting. You know, and and you had people who, same-sex people who went and just did a kiss in, in front of the, the governor's residence. You know, would that's targeted? That would not be allowed into this, right? Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's always uh, dangerous to engage in hypotheticals. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Cunningham, if you would just uh, unmute, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, it's always dangerous to address hypotheticals and the legal analysis. However, I would suggest that it would, 
we'd focus on the fact that this is not, this is about every residence in town. This ordinance, and because it has to be content neutral, um, it would apply to many things that involve unwanted speech when a person is inside their residence. And I'd have to stress that. It's, it's, it really, it's a town-wide ordinance that applies to every single residence in town, if adopted. Um, and that it would be any type of speech that constitutes picketing under the definition of picketing, um, whether it's one side of an issue or another. Uh, it just, it, it, it can't be something that targets specific types of speech or actions that picketing, it has to be across the board. That's what, that's what makes it um, neutral, and that's what, that's what makes it fair, that's what makes it constitutional. Gotcha. So the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I guess the... It, muted. I, I thought I unmuted myself, sorry about that. Hey, thank you, I appreciate that. You know, so if, the, only, the only way someone's going to get to me as a member of the select board, you know, uh, e other than email or phone call is to to pick it in front of my place. You know, we we I don't work here. I mean, we have a select board we have a select board office here. Me, but but we don't work here. You know, and and so so I just have a hard time be making it impossible for someone to get to me. You know, and and we I can appreciate you know the discomfort. Me, but that's kind of part of the. The, the purpose mean uh, protest you know uh, I, I would like to think that the, the state you know has put some bounds me so that we they can't do it after a certain time me so it can't keep me up all night you know um, and I, I would imagine there are other restrictions me I don't know what they are you know uh, and so it, for it to just kind of cut it off completely I mean I just I just have such a hard time with it, you know, and, and I, I just feel that I, I, I signed up for it. I know my, my, my neighbors didn't, you know, but it, it is part of our, our system, I, mean, I think, I mean, democratic system. And I hear the other argument, and that is, well, they're not signing up for an invasion of privacy. And I, I have a little issue with the, the notion of privacy, but I'm not going to argue with it too strongly because it seems like it's settled. Law, but but it, for me, privacy is like, I mean, you can't like physically come into my space. Me, but w w the way I'm understanding it now is like you can't do anything that I can perceive me um, that I don't like me because that's an invasion of of my privacy. You know, and and even though I understand that that's settled law, the. <sighs> I just, I just have a hard time getting the yes on this. So I put my arguments out there, you know, and so I welcome the counter arguments. Please bring me to your side, you know. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And if you would mute, sir, I think we'll go to Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and one of the things, Mr. Diggins, is are there other alternatives to protest? And, and our colleague, Carl, like Mr. Helmuth, is so where there are protests that take place daily at the State House, outside the governor's suite, and in front of the building. And, and so, and, and there could be protests here in front, of, in front of Town Hall. The Supreme Court has said that, 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 that the home is, is, is separate in terms of the, the, this, this right to privacy, particularly where the picketing is targeted and, and rises to a certain level. And I think some of the questions you have were addressed, at, what we call them dicta in, in, in the Supreme Court decision in, in Frisbee uh, v. Schultz in terms of you know, what, what would rise to, to that level. But I, I think there is a, a clear distinction. Um, the governor's office is not in her home or any individual official. Mr. Hurd could talk to an, an incident that, that he had at, at, at his home as well. And that's, that's a separate situation. We don't have a governor's mansion. We don't have something that's separate where there's office and, and home together. And, and I think that's a, um, and, and I might be stepping over my bounds in terms of our two attorneys here, but I, I just see a, a, a difference here and in, in, in maybe some additional discussion in terms of how that, how that is um, flushed out and how it would be looked at and, and, and maybe, um, as we go through this, maybe some information from Chief Flaherty from the calls that came in too, in terms of, w or, or the nature of the protests that, that, that gave rise to this. Um, but I, I think there's a clear distinction. I turn to Attorney Cunningham between the, a home versus the official business address of, you know, whether it's a, 
a business person, a doctor, an elected official, a college president, it, it, it just, it, it, there, there's a difference. And uh, unmute and go for it. Thank you, sir. Attorney well, Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in response to Mr. DeCourcy's comment, absolutely, the, the courts have clearly distinguished between places of business and places where people reside uh, and the different levels of constitutional protections that are afforded people when they exist in those two places. And I would just note that perhaps, and maybe, maybe this is helpful, Mr. Diggins, in response to the earlier question about particular hypothetical scenarios, but the definition of picketing as considered by the court in Frisbee was that, and it isn't very helpful, but defined as a posting at a particular place, and they cited Webster's Dictionary for that, but they considered that particular definition to be in line with the ordinance that was seeking to limit activity focused on a single residence. So with use of that language, hypothetically, any activity that's focused on a single residence in a picketing manner, posted in a manner, would be violative of that particular ordinance. And similarly, if enacted by the town of Arlington, it would be violative of this particular proposed bylaw. Thank you, Attorney Cunningham. Um, Mr. Hurd, did you have something? I mean, I have a number of comments and some responses, but I think we're getting into our, our post-public comment portion. So I would suggest we take public comment and then maybe be first out of the gate after. Remind me of that. Ditto. Um, I did have a question for, for um, Mr. DeCourcy. He mentioned that the, uh, our police chief was here, and I think if uh, Mr. DeCourcy might suggest that if you did want to uh, elicit any particular information, just as a matter of information to the board before we go to our public comment, perhaps this would be a time, appropriate time to, to make that inquiry, and you could leave that off. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, if I could, Chief Flaherty is here. If I could ask. The chief, um, the, when, the, when the various protests took place, maybe the calls that came in to the police department and, and the Arlington Police Department's response. And, and thank you. Before you do, Attorney Munson, if you can, can you turn on the video for the, and the Zoom there so that people can see the police chief? Perfect. Thank you. Chief Flaherty. Thank you, sir. So in the past several months, the Allington Police Department has responded to three separate um, protests at the governor's house. Um, the first protest was um, early in the fall. Uh, 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 one moment. I think that, I think that computer is muted, sir. I'm still showing it as muted. Do you see it differently on it? So the first protest was early in the fall. It was um, I'm still showing us muted. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We need to get that computer unmuted. There we go. Good no, go. Okay. All right. uh, if you start over, please. Thank you for your patience. Sure. So first protest um, early in the fall. Uh, it was a planned protest. I believe the um, organizers had come before the board or um, had asked the select board for permission, um, and we were able to communicate with the organizers. It was very peaceful. Um, the second protest was on October 14th in 2023. That occurred at about 9 p.m. Um, this instant, there were 25 to 30 protesters who parked about a mile away from the governor's house, marched um, in formation, wearing military clothing, um, face coverings, hats, to the governor's house, where they formed up in front of the house. Um, they had flares, they were chanting, they had horns, and um, they were using obscenities to the police officers, to the residents who had come out, and um, after about 20 minutes, they dispersed. The third protest was on February 10th. That occurred at around 6.30 p.m., and um, that was very similar to the second protest where these um, 25 to 30 protesters marched at, from a, separate a different location to the governor's house where they um, lined up. Um, same type of behavior. They had flares. They had horns. Um, and that protest lasted for about nine minutes. On both of th those two separate protests, the Arlington Police Department received multiple 911 calls. We received multiple calls to our um, business line where people were in fear. Um, we had people who were trying to leave their residence to pick up small children or um, teenage children. Um, they couldn't get out of their driveways because the protesters were blocking. We had um, residents called the station because they were expecting people to come to their house and the protesters were blocking the roadways. Um, and we heard from multiple residents after who um, really were in fear and they had children who were traumatized. 
and um, you know it was a disruption to the neighborhood. So having this bylaw would certainly be a tool in our police officers' tool belt that they could use to ensure the safety of all of the residents of Arlington. Thank you, Chief Flaherty. Did you have anything else, Mr. Carson? Um, no question, but I, I, I did want to th thank Chief Flaherty for all of the work that she and the department have done, and, and, and the coordination is if people, I mean, the state police are, are, are also, let's say the coordination between the Arlington Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police too, and, and the extra work that Chief Flaherty has done in terms of uh, just looking at other instances outside of, of Arlington and, and, and providing um, you know, top-notch service and to, to the community, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Chief. And uh, if, you, if you can, stick around in case there are additional questions from the board after we get there. Thank you very much. Any further comments from the board before we move to public comment? Okay, at this time, let's start the public uh, comment portion of our meeting. We can go ahead and leave that, that screen on, Ms. Attorney Munson. And um, I know that Mr. Fisher has been patiently waiting in the room um, to comment on this article. Uh, if you are in Zoom and wish to comment on that article, please raise your hand in Zoom at this time. And um, we will get to you uh, after our participant in the room. There's a three-minute uh, limit. Three-minute limit for public comment. Um. So I'm just gonna... okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and just in, and for those of us who don't know you, just introduce yourself, sir. Go ahead. Um. Thank you, and thank you to the town manager for submitting this warrant article. Uh, what I'm going to say, I hope, will make for a much stronger majority yes vote in the meeting I attended for um, Len's uh, meeting with town meeting candidates, the three other town meeting members, existing members, um, all were very opposed with a lot of reasons. Um, I ask you to support the change to the bylaw. In addition, I ask you to support creating a resolution to justify the change based on the following kinds of ideas. Today's free speech policies are largely guided by the logic of the slippery slope, but Violating the privacy and feelings of security of a private home is more a behavior, not speech. Free speech, in my opinion, must convey such things as ideas, information, argument, persuasion, and so on, for it does not qualify as speech. When speech crosses over into violating those feelings of privacy and security in a home, it becomes more a behavior, a domain that we may regulate. We've already had a town manager move out of town for reasons he openly discussed on ACMI. Must we continue to support free speech regulations that can make it necessary for a public official to move or for anyone to move? We hear that we cannot vote a limitation on demonstrations in front of a private residence because the ACLU will sue the town. I predict the ACLU will not sue the town <clears throat> without being able to answer this request. Give us actual examples of diminished free speech caused by the slippery slope theory, such as after we pro prohibited television advertising for cigarettes, did anyone argue for other forms of censorship because we cannot draw the line? We prohibit child porn have these prohibitions been used to justify other forms of censorship? Germany outright prohibits various forms of Nazi speech. Has it diminished in any, other, in any way other free speech rights in Germany? Conversely, people in states like Florida are removing books from libraries despite our severe free speech protections, which begs the question in what way does protecting the right of Nazis to demonstrate in front of a private home actually protect us from, from censorship? Perhaps existing policy in these times needs an update. We have three or four weeks 
to support the bylaw that's change that's been made and write a resolution justifying the amendment. A good place to start is with Louis Brandeis's logic where he recognizes that a right to privacy is embedded. <coughs> in the overall purpose of the Constitution. Sorry for the pronouns. The makers of the Constitution undertook to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness. They recognized the significance of man's spiritual nature, his feelings, and his intellect. You could, uh, you uh, could you wrap, it wrap it up, Mr. Fisher, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, they conferred against the government the right to be left alone. To conclude, let's not allow the threat of a lawsuit to prevent us from having a town where people f feel secure in their own homes, even in the midst of uh, civic debate. One more sentence. Please support for the work to create a better balance between free speech rights and the, left to be, the right to be left alone in one's home in a way that maintains our free speech rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's now turn to Zoom, and I think we have... Uh, Mr. Loretti on the phone that we can allow to talk. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Chris Loretti again. Um, I guess I would like to say I, I find this article offensive in a number of ways. Um, first, just procedurally, um, I know the town manager talks about people contacting him. And that's what prompted him to put this article forward. I'm, I'm not sure I completely believe that. And I think if individuals, um, you know, have these types of concerns, and I don't care if their surname is heard or DeCourcy or anything else, they ought to be putting the article forward themselves, and that ought to be reflected in the warrant, or they should be going before your board in a public meeting and getting your board to put it forward. I don't think the town manager should be letting himself be used this way to put these types of articles forward. But more importantly, I find this article substantively um, offensive as well. And I know the town, manage, the town council writes a lot about how it was, is constitutional under the U.S. Constitution, but he doesn't say anything about the state constitution. And the state um, uh, rights, declaration of rights in that constitution, and I really question whether, whether it would um, pass muster in that regard. As you know, um, from the recent um, decision regarding speech to select boards, the state constitution goes well beyond what the federal constitution allows. Um, so I have a lot of problems with that as well. And, and I also like, find it really offensive that, for example, that parents or teachers could not silently picket in front of the governor's house a cut in school aid to the town, or they couldn't do the same in front of a member of the school committee's house if they were cutting programs they believed were important. Those are not disruptive of neighbors. You're completely banning that type of activity, and that's completely unacceptable. I have to wonder if you were on the Washington, D.C. City Council, if you'd be banning protests in front of the White House. Mr. DeCourcy mentioned that the city of Boston has a um, ordinance on targeted protests, protests in front of residences. And I suggest you take a look at that, look at it, because it does not ban them at all. All it does is limit the hours at which they can occur. And I was hoping that the leaf blower article would come up tonight, because I really think it would say a lot about your board and its priorities. If, you're, if you privilege the noise of leaf blowers, which certainly dis disturb neighbors, above that of free speech, this article goes way too far. It does not strike the appropriate balance between free speech rights and, and, the, and, the, and the rights of neighbors to enjoy their properties. And I think you really need to uh, rethink this and not go forward with the suggested vote that's been presented to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We need it there. Good. Any other members of the public wish to speak on this article? Raise your hand in Zoom, please. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap up the public portion of uh, this hearing, and we'll now turn to Mr. Hurd, as promised. Mm -hmm. I forget what I was going to say. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 
I just think, you know, I think Mr. Diggins had posed a few of his comments to us for, for reaction. And, you know, I, I think to some extent we know, and I mean, you could say this about the governor, that, you know, she knew when she was, you know, running for office that the, there'd be some attention. I think we know that we get some attention and someone might stop us at stop and shop or certainly come into our meetings. I think to the extent that you would mentioned that some people have no other way to contact you. I, I mean, I think there's plenty of ways to contact us these days, um, you know, by email. Our phone numbers are out there um, in these meetings. You know, outside of Warren article here season, we have open forum at any meeting that that we want that someone wants to, you know, pose any concerns to us. And, you know, I, I certainly understand First Amendment concerns. I, I think Mr. DeCourcy had alluded to a much more minor situation in my house than what has occurred at the governor's house. But, you know, a couple of years back, there was a protester, and I won't even go into, you know, what he was saying, but it was one guy, and we weren't home. And our neighbors called and said, there's some guy walking out, walking back and forth in front of your house, shouting something. So one of my neighbors went out and kind of shoot him along and said, you know, I agree with you, but, you know, this is not the forum for it, and he was gone. Um, but it did shake up my wife and my two young boys, even though it was just one person, it was one person who knew where we lived and was at our house, you know, not so much with ill intentions, but it was enough to kind of scare them and I had to go buy a ring camera and, and whatnot. And the boys would look out the window and say, is anyone out there? And I think that for me, it was, a little bit of a scary situation, and I think it's not necessarily what we sign up for. You know, we serve a, and this is, I, I just put it in the context of this one board. It's like, you know, we, someone has to serve on this board, and I don't think that just serve on this board means you should have to deal with protesters um, on a daily basis. But again, and I think there's other ways for people to get in contact with us. I know, you know, a lot of, of this article is focused particularly on the governor's house. But I think in any instances, and I think the hypothetical that you brought up, Mr. Diggins, I think is telling on how this article is broadly painted, right? I think you had talked about a hypothetical governor that I don't think anyone on this board would have voted for or supported. And I certainly would, would um, would encourage and support the efforts that were that you had put forth, but th that would also be targeted protests that would be, that would be prohibited un under this law, as Attorney Cunningham mentioned. So it isn't really meant to target one type of group and one political viewpoint. It's I think and it's evenly handed. It's e written. So it, you know, is unbiased to any political position. And for me, I just, I think the safety concerns and the privacy concerns, are they outweigh, you know, the First Amendment concerns and not to minimize the First Amendment, but within the bounds of the decisions of, of the U.S. Supreme Court, we're taking action that we're appropriately allowed to do so. And it's certainly something that, you know, for our municipality makes sense. If we were on the city council in Washington, DC, I think we would probably have different situations, but this board is not taking a look at this Warren article and applying it in every situation. We're taking a look at this Warren article and seeing if it's appropriate for the town of Arlington. And I think it is. Um, and I think I would be happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan, and unmute. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
given this one a lot of thought. Um, when I came in tonight, had a, I had a conversation with the chief, um, and I had been listening, as we all do, every Warren article, um, but especially guided on this one. And um, I guess for me, um, what weighs a lot with me is my police chief coming to me, um, speaking about her being able to do her job as well as um, the patrol officers and ranking officers on down also being able to do their job. <clears throat> and um, I understand the free speech element of it, but I'm, I'm thinking more of the safety and, and responding to residents, um, which I believe didn't include the governor. I think it was uh, the rest of the Arlington residents are, um, around the governor um, who were legitimately um, fearful to different um, levels and magnitude. Um, and I put myself in the place of when our police department has to respond to that, um, and they're really limited in what they can do, and um, the job is hard enough as it is. Um, and when the chief said, you know, this would give us another two to, to employ to um, respond to those calls to fellow, fellow Arlington residents, plus, um, I certainly would like to see where town meeting weighs in on this. Um, so my free speech um, doctrine that I came in thinking, gee, I don't think I'm going to vote for this one, um, uh, it, it weighs a lot with me when um, my police chief comes before me, um, outlines situations, uh, not from the person who was... Um, quote unquote targeted or the prime audience, but um, the residents in that neighborhood. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that and, and see what motions are made and, and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I think I'll share a few um, thoughts of my own. Um, I've also given this one a lot of thought and I think that I, I find um, many of the comments really helpful. Really hearing the police chief's description of the actual situation and also Mr. DeCourcy's witness um, really drove home to me that this is not just a matter of noise, it's a matter of disruption, it's a matter of infringing on the neighbors, some of the neighbors' ability um, to get in and out of their homes, made them feel um, unsafe. And I think Mr. Hurd's comments that this is really specific to Arlington, Arlington's neighborhoods. These houses in all of Arlington are very close to one another. It's a very different situation than Washington, D.C. or other places. Um, and I think that you know, that weighs heavily on me as well. I think a good case has been made that homes are just different. You know, that, that it really, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we should say lightly that our family members and our friends didn't sign up for this. We did. And when I go out in public, and we all go out in public as members of the select board. People come here, people could come here and say things, say mean things about me if they want, and that is their constitutional right. Um, they can see me out in public. They can see me at the grocery store, public places. They can see me at, and my Zoom just went down, so Mr. Hurd, could I um, borrow your computer? All right, I'm now on Mr. Hurd's computer. Thank you very much. Um, they can see me out in public. They can stand in front of town hall. And I think when it comes to the governor, um, as Mr. Corsi mentioned, Protests and demonstrations happen regularly at the State House, on the steps, outside the governor's suite, sometimes loudly. The governor keeps a public schedule, goes to public meetings um, all over the state, and, and people can and do show up with protest signs there. There is no lack of access to the governor or any other public official to express your political and exercise your constitutional rights. Uh, the only issue is, is that does that right need to be unlimited and does it need to infringe on our family members and on our children and our neighbors who, as we've heard testimony tonight, have not felt safe? For me, the answer is no. This is not even a particularly difficult one. The only reason I think it warrants careful, a lot of care and a lot of thought is because we are balancing important constitutional rights, important democratic rights. 
And I think my colleague, Mr. Diggins, you know, intimated, you know, we, we, this is a matter of settled law. This is not a question of this being, of this being constitutional. But I think there is a moral question that we should weigh, and, and I have weighed, um, and that is, should we do it anyway? I think for me, I hope the town meeting agrees uh, that we should, because specific to Arlington, specific to the facts that we've heard tonight, specific to the fact that as elected officials, um, people get in touch with me all the time. I answer a lot of email, I get phone calls, um, I welcome conversations I have on my walks in my neighborhood and my community. I'm not hard to find. I think there are lots of ways to do that. I don't feel that, I, that we need to give people an unlimited right to bother or scare my neighbors or my spouse uh, because of what I signed up to do. So that's where I'm at tonight, and uh, anyone would make a favorable motion, I'd be happy to support that. And I think my Zoom is back, so I'll go back to my computer. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. <laughs> Mr. Diggins, and unmute, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Made up. So I, I do have made up maybe a question or two for, for the police chief. Sure. Uh, chief Flaherty? And uh, Attorney Munson, if you can unmute that machine. Thank you, Chief. So you say they were blocking the street. You know, so isn't that illegal? Yes. yes. Just, a, just a moment. So, so we could have done. It, it's, you know, Mr. Mr. Dickin, because of the audio visual, if you could, could you try to group your questions and then maybe give the chief a chance to kind of address them all, if possible. I'll try, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Yeah, you know, I bet but, you can. But, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just yeah. You know, I'll, I'll try and get better. Yeah, no, do, do you so, best, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, my thought back. Uh, so, was there a remedy? I mean, without this bylaw to the blocking of the streets? Yes, there yes, would be. In certain, mute yourself. In certain circumstances, absolutely. Um, these two specific protests, we, um, we were working closely with the state police and we were basically waiting for more resources to take any type of action. An arrest would be our very last resort. Our officers are trained in de-escalation skills and that's what they did at both of these protests. They did outstanding jobs at de-escalation. I was invited to um, the state police barracks recently to view the body one footage the camera footage of the state troopers who were wearing um, body-worn cameras, and it just highlighted how well the Allington Police Department handled these situations. So yes, there are remedies, but an arrest is the very last resort. We don't want to have to do that. What would the bylaw, if we change, if, what, what would this do, what, this, what would this allow you to do differently in, in a case where they're blocking the streets? This would allow us, the bylaw would allow us to shut the protests down immediately. All right. Is there some other way other than this bylaw to get the ability to protect and to keep you from blocking the streets, you know? Can you clear? I'm sorry, that question wasn't clear. I mean, so I guess I'm wondering, is there some other remedy than a bylaw like this be to you know, prevent people from blocking streets be it or, or, or creating a sense of fear? Um, I'm, I'm still not clear on what you question. Oh, yeah. That's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm just not in a position to answer, uh, phrase the question any better. So it's not your fault. You know, I'm just, I guess what I'm trying to want, figure out is if there is some other way, I mean, other than just completely shutting down, I mean, the protests, you know, uh, to uh, uh, allow people, I mean, to feel safe in their neighborhoods, you know, and still allow people to do some level of protesting, you know. And so, I mean, so for instance, earlier on we were talking about having time limits, you know, on the protests. Me, but my sense is that that wouldn't be good enough. You know, I'm just, I, I'm just really having problems with shutting down me, the the protests all the time. Me, and and also, uh, there are, I think, times when the 
we need to kind of allow a, us as people to kind of push you know, each other to, to do things differently. You know, and so I mean, I gave a hypothetical, you know, uh, and 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 it's it's more about trying. It's not even a matter of safety at that point. It'd be a matter of a neighborhood finding me, me something that people don't like. You know, he, they feel that it's morally bad, he, and you have another group of people who think, no, this is these are our rights. Me, these are us. I mean, and we really want to get you to to change. I mean, and and they would do be uh, a protest, and it might even be targeted. I mean, at at the leaders. You know, and and yes, it would make the leaders uncomfortable. It make the neighborhood uncomfortable. I mean, but for me, you know, that that is part of the the democratic process. You know, and and I just have a hard time saying. And and, and as you all have admitted, I mean, that would be prohibited. Uh, in this, I mean, and and it's that kind of pushing, I mean, of leaders, I mean, and even neighbors, I mean, who may support the those kinds of policies, I mean, it's a way that we we push ourselves, I mean, uh, and and I just the thought of of just shutting it down completely, I mean, I I, I, found, I came to the state, I'm gonna regret the vote that I take. Either way, you know, uh, it's just a matter of which one, you know, will I regret less and which one, you know, do I think, I mean, I can feel better with, you know, um, in the short term and the long term. And so, so I just can't get myself to, to yes just yet, you know, and so that's where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Thank you, and you can remit yourself. Um, I did turn to Mr. Herb, but I, before I forget, I just want to, kind of personally respond to it. I think the hypothetical you raised is, is a thought-provoking one. Um, I can, I've thought about this since you raised it. If we had a public official like a governor who believed that I should not be married to my husband and had other abhorrent views, I would take to the streets, I would lie down, I would take a bullhorn, I would do whatever I would, but I wouldn't do it at that governor's house because I don't want that kind of civil society. I would go to the state house. I would go to public events. I would go to the public library. I would do a die-in like we did for uh, AIDS action back in the day, but I wouldn't do it at their house because I don't want that kind of society. That's why I feel the way I do. And I think that that's what makes me, I respect anyone who has, I think we're gonna have a spirited debate about this at town meeting. I think that's healthy because I like where people are coming from who worried about this. But for me, um, it comes down to what kind of town we wanna have and what kind of political discourse we have. I have no problem making public officials uncomfortable. That's the job of democracy. For me, the question is where to draw the line. And I think we're gonna draw the line in different places, but that's how I approach the hypothetical. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Um, just sort of along those lines and responding to Mr. Diggins, I mean, I don't think any of us, nor the chief, thinks that if we pass this bylaw, it's going to stop all the protests, right? So to say, well, you know, we're banning them, then they can't happen. I think there'll still be protests. I think it just, you know, in your question, it allows them to, you know, gather up the, the protesters and, and make a situation safe quicker. And again, it's not a criminal, we can't, we don't pass criminal laws, so they can't go, I don't think the Islander Police Department is gonna go inside arresting people, right? Because they can't, not, at least not based on this. And so it just helps them kind of de-escalate a situation. I mean, I've seen the amazing de-escalation training that the Arlington Police goes through and we've seen it in, time and time again, not just in these protests where that's exhibited in practice. But um, I think that this, again, it's not gonna stop all protests. It just will, kinda allows the police department to be able to contain the situation. And I mean, it's similar to what Mr. Helm, you said. I, you know, we've seen, over the past few years, we've seen a number of protests. And some may have been targeted towards, 
decisions that we've made and you know the best place to protest us is on the steps of town hall i think and we've seen those we've seen protests you know in the town hall gardens we've seen protests in Whittemore park i think that there's a lot of more visible and more effective places to let to lend your voice to a specific cause in this town and in other parts of the commonwealth to to do that and i think it again the, the house is uh, like we don't have as was mentioned we don't have a government mansion whether it's us the governor you got to sleep somewhere so you know in very few places have no neighbors so to create a situation where you just allow unlimited protests it just i certainly am sympathetic to your concerns mr diggins and the concerns of the individuals that have spoken against this um it's not something to to tread lightly on when it's talking about the first amendment but i just think that the way it's written um it is something that is appropriate at this time for this town and who knows in eight years and a new town meeting might say that hey listen you know we had that law but it's no longer appropriate for arlington and they can you know take a crack at changing the law back to the way it is or repealing the, the prohibition but for right now i think this is now narrowly tailored and i think it's appropriate for to keep the peace and it's for and we're up here to you know come up with what is the general betterment of for the residents of arlington and i think that is the situation here and eventually we've had these discussions where we've I think massage and, and gone back and forth with some of the language in these Warren articles, but eventually, you know, we got to vote on it, and we might be on the same side. We might not be on the same side. So, I mean, I, at this point, I think I, I'll move favorable action on the Warren article. Yeah, we did need to do that. Do I have a second on that? Second. If I could, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Thank, Corsi, yeah. thank, thank you, and, and, and thank you for your, for your words. And, and, and this is, First Amendment analysis is, 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 is challenging, but I mean, I think for, for me, and as, as Mr. Helmuth said, the significant government interest here is the right to, to pri residential privacy, and, 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 and that's, that, that's what the, the, the court case, uh, the, the Frisbee case, discussed. But the other thing that was very important in that case is the inquiry, are there alternatives for the message? And that's a, that's a key thing. And in, in that case, it was found that there, there were alternatives. And, and, I, and I think that, that probably in the comments that we have, depending on how our vote is, um, those will be mentioned. And, and so that's, that's part of the balancing that takes place in, in, in the First Amendment cases. And um, we see in the excellent memo from attorneys Cunningham and, and Munson those five questions that need to be asked is, is the bylaw content neutral on its face? Is there a significant government interest? Are there alternatives? Um, and, and so it's, and, and is it specific enough where it's focused on the specific home? That's what brings in the constitutional protection. I do want to say one thing. I, I had mentioned earlier before the public comment, I was aware of the Boston bylaw, and the Boston bylaw was between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m., and I was aware of what happened in Brookline. In Brookline, because it went through town meeting, it was subject to review by the Attorney General's office, and the Attorney General's office signed off on it, so um, questions as to whether that would pass constitutional muster. Massachusetts have been answered in the case of Brookline, which their bylaw is almost identical, or very close to what's being proposed here, and I said earlier, the 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., and as Chief Flaherty said, the second protest, uh, or the third protest, was at 6.30. And once that happened, um, for me, anyway, a 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. restriction wasn't going to work. Um, and, and, and so narrow, narrowly tailoring the bylaw meant removing, having, having the prohibition at all hours um, because of that interest. So that's, just wanted to get that on the record in terms of what, what had been reviewed. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Attorney Cunningham. And I, um, there was a, somebody in Zoom who wants to make a further comment on this. I will accept that comment. So Heather, you can get ready um, if you're in Zoom to do that. And we'll turn to uh, Attorney Cunningham. You can go ahead and bring her into the meeting, Ashley. Attorney 
Mr. Um, um, did you want to go first, 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 sir? Thank you. Have the resident go first. Okay. Uh, do we have? Uh, do we have her in the meeting? Do we have her in the meeting, Ashley? I'm trying to promote her. Okay. We're trying to bring. Uh, bring uh, yeah. yeah, you can kill that for a second. It says that they're declined to. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there we go. So Heather, you sh should be able to unmute yourself at this time. Hi, can I be heard? Can people hear me? Okay. We, we got you. Go right ahead. Hey, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I just want to thank um, the chief of police and the state police. I'm the neighbor directly across um, from the governor, and I was not intending to make remarks tonight. Um, I will be going to town meeting to talk about um, how this has impacted um, the community, particularly my family. I was the individual when they talked about the person who had to be escorted out to get her child. Um, I am the person who um, the protesters are on my property. So for me, this is really about safety. This isn't about the issue of Nazis or this or that. This is about safety for our community. Um, and again, I just want to thank the chief of police. Um, her officers have been terrific in helping us navigate. Um, and I also just want to, I've been here for all three protests. Um, some have happened in the morning, some have happened at six and at nine. It doesn't matter what time they happen. Um, they still put a threat to our safety. The last one that happened at six o'clock, I had a neighbor get onto my lawn and start shouting at the protesters. Uh, and I was terrified. The protesters had flares in their open incendiary devices in their hands. I was concerned that they were gonna throw them at my house at the person who was yelling at them. Um, and I had to yell at him to get off of my yard. So this is less for me about the issues. Um, I, I, this is really about public safety. So I just wanted to make sure that that was heard. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Um, so we've, uh, I think, de facto reopened public comment on this. So I wanted to make sure that any other members of the public who want to speak on this article, so we can be completely fair, please raise your hand. Ms. Mar? Seeing no hands raised. Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, I think we're at the stage where we have any final discussion from our, our colleagues, and we do have a motion in a second. Any uh, final comments? Oh, Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to back up the, the comments made by Mr. DeCourcy, and it's been the effort from the legal department to with the draft warrant language. And it, we understand that the, there can be divergent views about what the town should do. However, we wanted to put the town in a position where they can be on solid legal footing that they can do this if they so choose. I think that any, uh, in the public comment, there was some arguments about Massachusetts, you know, Constitution. To me, the analysis doesn't change. Uh, this bylaw, as written, is constitutionally permissible. The question of whether the town wants to do is a different one. Um, so just want to say, it's, that's the position that the legal department wanted to put this board and uh, potentially town meeting in if they want to consider this. Thank you, and I do want to say that I feel exceptionally well served by the legal department in this and other matters. And it's as complicated. It deserved a lot of work and a lot of thought, and I think we got it. So thank you. Um, any further discussion, Mr. Dickens? So no, it's just my final comments. Ada, and go ahead and unmute, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ada. So um, I looked through our bylaws. And they are remarkably quiet I mean, on protests. I mean, uh, I don't just protest in the the um, the, the redevelopment um, um, bylaws. I mean, uh, and and it pretty much said that I guess this one little paragraph said that this shouldn't be, shouldn't infringe, should not be interpreted infringe on on protests. I Me mean, that are within certain kind of vague bounds. You know, but but they they, they were clear enough. You know. Uh, so, I mean, I, as Mr. Hurd said, I mean, we could vote this in, I mean, uh, Tommy could vote this in, and then we could look at it again, I mean, and, and maybe we will. I, mean, I, I would like, I would personally like for us to, to not go from zero to 100, you know, maybe like do something smaller uh, in between, but, you know, maybe town meeting will do that. But as for me, I mean, I remember when I first got elected, I mean, and the whole banner issue was a big deal. You know, I, mean, I seriously thought I mean, I mean, there might be protests I mean, in front of my place because of my position uh, on things. And people were pretty angry uh, with me about my position. You know, and, and you know, it never occurred to me, I mean, to, to even think about I me mean, creating the bylaw I mean, or whatever I mean, that would, would outlaw protests I mean, of that type I mean, in this town. 
you know. And yeah, I could say I signed up for it. I wasn't expecting that, you know. But you know what? Once I realized that was a possibility, it's like, well, you know what? That goes along with it, you know. And 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 yes, me, we're in a dense part of town, and I want to even be well, we're in a dense part of town, you know. And 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 and, we, and, and it's, it's a city, you know, and I kind of, you know, I kind of expect at times, me, I'm going to have to tolerate things that I may not want. I mean, barking dogs, me, you know, I mean, the next door neighbor's barking dogs, me, and I, I prefer not to hear that, eh, but that comes from being in a pretty um, dense area. And if it's talking about, like, invasion of privacy because I have something that I don't like, me, invading my personal space, me, that is me, but, but it's not a protest, but... For me personally, I'd have easier time with a protest you know, than I would with someone's dog that's barking, I mean, all times of day, you know. But the, the yeah, so I guess, I guess, oh, the last thing too is that, I mean, it's not enough, I mean, I know we say that people can, can protest here in town hall, you know. But you know what, you see a protest out there, you come in the building here, you come in here, and you're pretty much oblivious to it, you know, uh, at least I am. You know, and, but but a protest in front of my place me gets my attention, or it would get my attention. You know, uh, it, it probably wouldn't change my mind you know, because that's the way we are made up. But but it's 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 a more effective ploy. You know, and I think it's one thing when we are saying that we want to protect ourselves you know, from from things that make us afraid. You know, uh, and, and 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 if people are threatening us in some way, we want to protect ourselves from that. I'd like to think we have those protections anyways, but really what I'm concerned about is is sheltering ourselves or 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 making it hard for people to get us to change me our 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 values, you know, when they feel that that's something that should happen, you know, and 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 so so for me, I mean, me protesting in front of my house is not a matter of like saying that's not the kind of society me I want. It's like I kind of want me people to push me. Me at times when they think I should be pushed. Me they shouldn't do it in a threatening way. But as I said, I think we have laws that can protect us um, from that. And 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 once again, you know, um, let's go a little slowly on this. Me, but but um, I've said all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion by the board? I appreciate the honest and hard work we've done tonight. We have a motion for favorable action by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have a four to one vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. That leaves us to Article 53, appropriation takings for the Stratton School Safe Routes. And I think we have Mr. Alessi. Uh, coming in to present about that over Zoom. And we have and slides. slides. As well. yep. I got you. I'm good. And is Mr. Alessi up yet? Yeah, we're, 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 go right, go ahead. right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So my name is John Alessi. I am the Senior Transportation Planner for the Department of Planning and Community Development. I'm here before you this evening to speak about um, the Stratton Safe Routes School Project and the proposed warrant article number 53 at town meeting this spring. Uh, next slide. So tonight's requested action from the board is to vote favorable action on board article 53, with the following draft motion language for town meeting that was shared by town council, Mike Cunningham. I won't um, reread the entire text language, but the summary of this is just for um, town meeting to vote to authorize the select board to acquire the land parcels and or rights and land parcels to obtain and secure a public right of way for the Stratton Safe Routes School project. Next slide. So to give some background on the project, the town received a MassDOT Safe Routes School Infrastructure Grant in 2019 with the project's purpose to provide a fully accessible walking route with safe roadway crossings for children and others to walk to the Stratton School. So I'll note that this is a MassDOT-led project. The agency has provided over 1.6 million in construction and design funding 
um, for this. And I'll also note that the only town funding required is the um, right of way acquisition process. Next slide. To give background on the project scope for those who aren't familiar with it. So um, the area where this project will be implemented is mainly on Hemlock Street and Dixon Ave with some improvements on Mountain Ave and Wheeler Lane. The key project components include new and repaired sidewalks, newer upgraded curb ramps, new curb extensions, and new rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which will um, help fill the project purpose that I mentioned beforehand. And you can see in the images to the right in dark black, the highlighted project area, and below that, um, an example of the sidewalk that would be implemented for a portion of the project on Dixon Ave. Next slide. So this word article is really revolves around the whole right of way acquisition process and to give background mass dots right of way bureau requires a town meeting vote to take or otherwise acquire by eminent domain purchase donation or any other means uh, land and around this um, project. So warrant article 53 is requesting that town meeting authorize the select board to vote to approve this right of way process for two reasons one. The right of way acquisition process needs to take place before the planned construction start date in summer 2025 and based on town meetings schedule only well normally only meeting once a year this could cause delays in the project's construction start and mass dots right of way bureau permits a town select board to um, take the vote from town meetings so those are the two reasons for this warrant article next slide So the project is currently at 75% design. It's working its way towards 100%. And I say that because as a project advances, there are always changes to the um, to the actual layout of the project, and therefore the actual right of way process and acquisition can change. But at this stage, I want to give some background on what the um, acquisition process is going to look like. You can see on the table I have right here. There are going to be 41 affected properties along the project area. And when I say affected properties, I mean the number of properties where there will be fee takings and or permanent or temporary easements. And I just want to note that an affected property might have more than one type of impact. So that's why if you try adding up the numbers to the right, they're not going to add up to 41. Uh, the project has three fee takings, meaning that it would be a complete transfer of ownership rights to another entity, that being the town, one permanent easement, this means when ownership remains with the landowner, but another entity may use the land permanently. And for this project, I believe this is just a utility permanent easement so that crews are able to access overhead wires. And there would be 42 temporary easements. Again, ownership remains with the landowner, but another entity may use the land temporarily. And when I say this, it's meant for construction crews that need to, when constructing the project, step onto someone's property. The town would be paying that landowner for the use of stepping onto the property in order to construct a public right-of-way project. So all in all, there are 41 affected properties. The image below is from one of the reference materials provided outlining each of the properties and the associated landowners. Uh, next slide. So the next steps for this project, if, if the select board this evening votes favorable action on this warrant article, um, I would present to town meeting and request, and then um, I would go to town meeting and request that they um, give the select board authorization to approve the right of way process when we get to that point. After, in the meantime, MassDOT is still finalizing the construction right of way plan since we are at 75% design. Um, it's the, pro the pro project can change from 75 to 100, but it's likely not to based on the just general scope of this project. So it probably will have the same amount of affected properties and types of easements I mentioned beforehand. The town would hire an appraiser to assess the values of the affected properties. And then I would come to the select board at that point to present on the project, the right of way acquisition plan and request a vote of approval, which again is required by the MassDOT right of way bureau. And then, then construction would start in summer 2025. Next slide. So again, the requested action this evening is to vote favorable action on warrant article 53 with the following language that was drafted by town council by Cunningham and um, deputy town council. 
Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the, pro about the project, the process, or anything else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. Um, um, I want to just uh, kick off by uh, clarifying and make sure I understand um, some particulars here. So this is a general vote to, to support a process, but that when we come down to specific takings, those would individually come, if town meeting approves this, those any specific decisions about specific properties, easements, permanent or otherwise, would would still come back to us for individual attention and decisions. Um, and maybe Attorney Cunningham could, could address that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correctly stated. This is simply an off. It, it's required that town meeting provide this authorizing vote. That if you look at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's right of way bureau requires that's a check on the list that you've received that authorization from town meeting. And I just want to thank Mr. Alessi for all his work on this. And also, Peter Buckley and, our, and the legal office has done a tremendous amount of work on this and appreciate his efforts, too. Thank you. Yeah, and I neglected to thank Mr. Alessi for a really comprehensive presentation and also the materials that you provided us. Thank you. Um, so I'll now turn to my colleagues for any questions before we turn to public comment discussion. Mr. Hurd? That was a super question, but I thought... I need to, I need to. Okay. I forgot what meeting we're in. I thought every lot in Arlington was subject to a sidewalk easement, whether or not there was a sidewalk there in the first place. Like right now, even if there's a sidewalk, we still would have like a public shade tree if it was within the town envelope. Like it was always my, because we have plenty of streets that don't have sidewalks in my neighborhood and I, it was always my thought that someone could walk on the first you know portion of a property to, so as they don't have to walk in the street attorney Cunningham that may be true mr. Hurd uh, thank you mr. chair but for purposes of this particular project uh, the state has set forth specific guidelines that we need to follow so for purposes of this particular warrant article uh, the easements required, the, this compensation uh, to which residents are entitled. We need to follow these procedures fairly closely to make sure we're, we're moving forward with the project in the way that they want us to. And, and I guess, like I said, Mr. Hurd, this is a specific requirement that the, the Bureau is asking us to take. They need that authorizing vote from town meeting. Okay. But, no problem. but on, your, on your larger question, I, I, I will endeavor to get you a, a more complete response. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I had discussed earlier a roadway discussion I had, and, and I may be able to, 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 to shed a little bit of light on that. I mean, normal rights of ways for streets, a lot of them are 40 feet wide, and, and what you see is the street itself is 24 feet, and the two sidewalks are 8 feet each, but there could conceivably be some streets that were accepted that the roadway is the entire width of the right of way, so, so it, it probably depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Feeney. And I think to elucidate that point further, Mr. Chair, thank you. <clears throat> in some of those, the actual fee interest that's listed in the table provided by MassDOT, you'll see instances where it's 16 square feet. So largely the sidewalk is being placed on public land, but for the full length of the parcel, for whatever reason, it has to be kicked over, you know, just a couple of inches and that accumulates over the course of the property. So. By and large, if there is no uh, sidewalk presently present, that a lot of times the public right of way does extend into those grassed areas, but it really depends on each and every street layout. Thank you, sir. Okay, now so I'll turn to the public. If there are any members of the public who wish to comment on this article, please raise your hand in Zoom or in the room. I'll never cease to be amused that those two things rhyme. <laughs> One attendee. Okay, uh, Ms. Marr? Seeing no hands raised, thank you. Very good, this concludes the public comment portion of this hearing. Any further discussion or motions from the board? Any favorable action? Second. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion for favorable action by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. That concludes our warrant article hearings for the evening. Thank you everybody for your patience and participation. We move to final votes and comments. We will take these um, 
individually. Um, so start with Article 15, the bylaw amendment, uh, prohibition of fair trade restrictions on fur products. And for the public certification, what we're doing here is um, as seen in the, in the Select Board's agendas page. These are uh, final vote language and, co and board comments that the legal department has prepared uh, following the Select Board hearings on these articles that were done at an earlier date. So we are just giving our final uh, sign off for uh, drafting into the Select Board report. So, starting with Article 15, any comments, corrections, questions from the board? Mrs. Mahan. Move approval. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Further discussion? Move a motion for approval by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Article 16, bylaw amendment, pet sale restrictions and retail pet sales. Any uh, comments, questions from the board? Or motions? Approval. Hmm? Do you have a second? Oh, I'll second. Yeah. Mrs. Cunningham? Attorney Cunningham, thank you, sir. And uh, if you'd unmute, sir. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe there's one change I need to make regarding uh, the fish portion of that comment and related to Mr. Diggins' comment that was at the, made at the meeting and I will make that change if I don't think it substantively alters the uh, draft comment. Duly noted. Any other discussion? Favorable motion by, uh, a motion to approve, sorry, by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Article 17, bylaw amendment, right to pet companionship. Any comments, questions, and motions on those votes and comments? Move approval. Okay. So, do, do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion on Article 17, final votes and comments? Yes. You Mr. Know, Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, unmute, please. Oh, you are unmuted. Yeah. Ah, you're ahead of me. No, 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 no never mind. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not intentionally, but so. Uh, I didn't. I didn't respond to you, uh, Mr. Cunningham, because this was a little complex. Because you didn't have a whole lot to go on. Because I, I didn't pursue my line of questioning with Mr. Schlickman because I didn't want it to get into an intense back and forth. You know, but but you know, when I talked about the the demand for it, like I said, like there were seventy five percent rentals. You know, or people who. I guess this assistant was that there seventy five percent of people who rent have pets. I wasn't really saying so much that the market has solved the problem. I, mean, I was really saying that there seems to be a demand, you know, uh, for for apartments that would allow I me mean, uh, people to have pets. So I was actually questioning I me mean, why doesn't I me mean, the market solve this? Because if I had property and I had a lot of people who had pets, you know, then then I might just go, okay, well, this place is open pet and kind of raise the price, be find out where where the market clears, I mean, and then of course added into that would be I mean some cost that comes along with maintaining the place that has pets. So I was just kind of wondering, I me, mean, why isn't the market solving that? And there's a little distinction here because I don't want to give the impression, I me, mean, that I feel that the market has solved this. It may very well be that a, a, maybe more people would have pets, I mean, if they could be you know, rent a property that allowed for pets. I mean, so, so that's really what I was trying to get across in, in that, that line of question. So do you get a sense then of maybe how to change? Okay, thank you. That's I think all. Attorney Munson's got that. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, any further discussion? So on a motion for, uh, to approve subject to revisions by Mr. Diggins, by Mr. Hurd, and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It is unanimous. Oh. Thank you. Well, one other thing. I did, I did. In the next one. This is actually for Mr. Cunningham. I, I did see you slipped an urge in there. Just saw <laughs> 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 Not even. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we don't strongly, strongly urge, I think we can let that slide. Apologies, Mr. Chairman. <laughs>
Okay, we have Article 18 Bylaw Amendment. Uh, good night, Mr. Fisher. <laughs> bylaw Amendment. Um, historic building demolition delay. Um, any comments, questions, or motions? Attorney Munson. Attorney Munson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to. Um, I got you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to note that in the second paragraph of the comment, it looks like the second sentence is the board noted that 12 months, that should actually be 24, so we can make that change. Thank you. Any other uh, any other discussion? I think um, need a motion. Move approval. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. <laughs> All right. Spread the. <laughs> On a uh, motion to approve by Mr. Hurd, subject to the correction by Attorney Munson, and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. It is unanimous. <laughs> I got it anyways. <laughs> Thank you. Article 19, a vote to extend the time for Artificial Turf, turf Study Committee and report. Comments, questions, motions? Approval. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Let's pick it up here. Okay, on a motion to approve uh, by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. That ends our final votes and comments. We are almost done, folks, with the, not only with this meeting, but with our run-up to town meeting. So that's a, a real achievement. All right, this brings us to new business. In cases of emergency, the board will neither deliberate nor act upon topics presented in new business. Ms. Marr. No new business, thank you. And remember to unmute yourself as we go along here. <laughs> yes. Attorney Cunningham. Just thank you to all and the efforts tonight to comply with the open, open meeting law uh, given the technical difficulties. Uh, excellent job by the board and staff. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Feeney. No new business, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, Attorney Cunningham kind of jumped ahead of me in that, but I do want to thank the chair and vice chair and anyone who hung out with us as long as they did for this. And I would just say going forward, um, similar to my job, day job, um, I always make sure I have two of everything. Actually, I have three, <laughs> um, but at least two. <laughs> so um, I, I hope this isn't something, especially for the select board and or any other board, committee or commission that also avails themselves the opportunity for this equipment. So um, I would, through you, Mr. Chair, please pass on the message. Please have two of everything. Three would be nice, but please have two. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Um, for those hockey fans out there, there was a barn burn, a really historic overtime win this weekend, and it was not the BC game against Quinnipiac. It was the uh, annual police and fire hockey game, and the fire department had taken the title for the past however many years I can remember, but the uh, police team fought valiantly, came back, scored a goal to tie up with 50 seconds and won in overtime. So congratulations to everyone that played. You know, I think it, it's a fun event for the kids. It's a fun event for the participants. It's certainly something that I, I used to look forward to when I was younger. Um, and congratulations to the police department. They're playing in, in, uh, in honor of Danny Kelly this year. So they really wanted to get a win for him and they did. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and and I, it, this is the last meeting that, uh, other than opening the next meeting, that you'll serve as, as chair. And I want to thank you and, and Mr. Hurd, you for serving as chair and, and Mr. Hurd as, as vice chair. And all of us have served as chair previously, so we all know um, the time commitment and the additional work that is involved. And, and I, speaking for myself, you did an outstanding job. I, I really enjoyed working with you as, as chair or, or having you as chair this past year and, and all that you did, your thoughtfulness, your, the, the way you conducted the meetings. And, and as a team, Mr. Hurd, there were a number of times that he had to step in uh, when you had to recuse yourself and you, you were a great team. The two of you, I, I do want to wish 
both of you the best of luck this Saturday. I don't think it would be necessary, <laughs> but... If I'm not duly re-elected by the <laughs> residents of Arlington, I just want to say it's been an honor and a privilege serving this board. But I want to thank you both. <laughs> And Thank I miss Flat Eric, but that's a whole other question. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Diggins. I knew you were going to do that, Mr. DeCourcy, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, so, so, so thank you for, for saying this much to me, but, but you should have seen those two at Candidates Night. I mean, I mean it's like, wow, I mean, they, 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 were, they were really good, you know, uh, and, and they, they made us all proud, you know, and so yes, uh, Mr. Chair, you did a wonderful job, you know, thank you very much, we, congratulations on uh, another three years, you know, and, you know, and uh, as much as I like being here on the first night, you know, of our, of our, our year, you know, uh, I like to dress up for that one. I will be in Buffalo, you know, so I, Buffalo. We, so I'll, I'll be zooming in, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll attend the meeting, but I just won't be here, you know, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for, and Mr. DeCourcy in particular, for your kind words. Um, it has been a rewarding year. It's been a challenging year. Um, but I think tonight's uh, team effort by everybody here in this room is just a really good example of why it is so rewarding and why it is a joy to serve in this role or any role um, in town. I think everybody, once we figured out how to do this, we actually got it going and everybody was diligent, everybody was patient, everybody um, worked really hard not just to observe the, the letter of the open meeting law, but the spirit of it, which is to ensure fair and equal participation. And you know, I, I think we've had an example tonight of some good, robust debate. We had participants in Zoom uh, disagreeing, and we had, we had good um, dis discussion amongst the board, and we did it in a way that, that fulfilled the letter and the spirit of that. And that makes me very proud uh, of all of us tonight, but all of us, the, the work that we do. And um, so I appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll see uh, what happens on Saturday. And I'll note, Attorney Cunningham will get his first opportunity to chair a meeting of the select board uh, next Monday. That's you right. You might not even know that. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's true. All right, I believe we have finished our business. I will entertain a motion to observe, to observe. adjourn. <laughs> so moves. Oh. Second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to observe. To adjourn by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. Hurd. What were All you saying about chair? No, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.